Dude, that, this is feeling kind of weird, thingsy. Uh, let's do this. I will do a mono recording. Check, 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 check. Peeking out just above negative six. What about you, Justin? Hello, hello. I am talking to you. Talking to you now. Perfect. In voice that is a thing. Just uh, Andrew? Hello. I won't be talking that loud. I'm talking right now out my mouth hole. There you go. And we are, it looks like, good I'm to go. my phone. Yeah. Uh, let me shut this door because I think family's coming home in the middle of all this. Oh, let me uh, tweet this out. So we're live on Diamond Club TV. So let me uh, what's up on the Twitter. If Twitter would load. It'd be great. There we go, Twitter. That's not what I wanted. Um, somebody's crying next door. Uh, so we're going to see how long I can run my 3d printers before my neighbors complain. How, how big of a noise does it make? Um, I go out right out. Like if I stand outside by my window, can't hear it. Barely, barely, barely hear it. Air conditions are much louder. Um, I just don't know what it does through doors or walls. What, what, how would you compare the noise to like a regular paper printer? Oh, it sounds like a loud paper printer. Okay. You know, there's a, uh, in fact, I mean, if you just hear the, I mean, because it's a very similar mechanism. Um, it just sounds like that with yeah. you know, a bunch of fans blowing. What, what would you think about moving it into your room? Um, if it I were super to, loud. Yeah, I would be able to sleep. I mean, that's, you know, it's like, we're ha it's like having, you know, a printer printing out paper nonstop. Yeah. Um, and I've got two of them now, two of the, the flash forges and going to get a third. Oh yeah. All right, Cyrus. All right. I'm live right now on diamondclub.tv with at Justin Robert Young and sure talking about weird things. Yeah. Um, we're getting, all right. I'm ready. Awesome. All right, ready? Counting you in in five, four, three. Oh, dude, Alpha Geek Radio. Hold on. Uh, That's a whole thing. Uh, and, da, 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 da. Alpha Geek Radio. It's channel three. Is that what it is, guys? Um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, there's... Uh, uh, channel by, three is where we go. Uh, by the way, Neshcom, the... But defaults for when we do night attack are still defaulting to, uh, uh, like it always defaults to Alpha Geek One with the stream info of Weird Thing for some reason. I don't know why, so I always have to change it, and, and then hit go. Oops, nope, it can't connect because I haven't clicked Weird Things, which is there that, and now connecting, connecting. <laughs> Uh, it still says connecting. 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 Submitted. Staying. Ready, ready to fire. You know, when I thought this up, I went for a walk and I dreamed up the mechanism for it. Yeah. Problem is, is like, you know, like, you ever dream something like, oh, that's awesome. You get in reality, like, oh, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Like, I originally had, like, the releases pointing, you know, this way. Uh which I'm like, oh, it's perfect because then they, they, I can just activate it in my wrist and that'll snap it. And then I'm like, yeah, and the rubber bands will shoot backwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, just, I show you this. Hey, guys, is there anything I'm missing on this? It's Alpha Geek 3, weird things. I save the settings and I hit go. I submitted the, state, the stream control. Uh, sometimes you do just need to stop it and start it again. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it might just be a, a fart out today. Uh. Somebody's calling me from Oklahoma. Do you know who this would be? 
Oh, 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 Oklahoma, where? Oklahoma, 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 Hello. Oklahoma. Oh. Hey, what's up? Hello. Wait, say, say it again. Uh, which Gavin? Oh, I, I, hey, I'm sorry. I'm actually live on the air right now. Uh, is is is? Uh, can I get you to call back later on? Okay. Yeah. All right. You've got to take this call right now. Dude, so I can tell you. Well, I I thought it was uh, I thought it was maybe um, uh, Todd from Alpha Geek Radio. Instead, like, the guy was genuinely annoyed that I wasn't taking his call right now while we were live on the air. Was he just a rando? Yeah, I, I don't know. He's like, hey, man, it's uh, it's Gavin. You remember Gavin? I was like, <laughs> I was like, I, I, uh, what? What? Gavin? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm not getting a connection here, guys. I don't know what to tell you. Um, do we, do we tech this out or do we dive in or what? Uh, uh you know, I don't know what, I feel like, uh, we might just have to abandon the butt. Yeah. Uh, so the fun part is whenever I, I tweet this out and we get people who've never seen this or have any idea what we're doing here. Oh like, dude, they walk in and they're like, Oh, this is where a bunch what? of people try to connect to and a this, streaming this, service. This is- is this a game show where three really technically inept guys try to work? Yeah, all right. I, I, I say we bail on this. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Alpha Geek is, I mean, unless you guys see something that I've missed, I mean, I could, I can actually close out all of butt and relaunch it. And let me double check. Stream control says that what weird things is live. Open it up, but again, changing the settings again to Alpha Geek 3. Stream info, weird things, save settings, hitting go connecting 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 is all i get mm-hmm. yeah sorry guys all right i'm um, calling it hey bonnie's here right on uh do you have kids yeah. cool also all right well we're, we're, we're late i have to go i have to i thank you i love you it all worked out all right gentlemen ready to get so weird here we go. Five, four, three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hi. And Brian Brushwood. Mm, the technically inept Brian Brushwood. Apologies to everyone not watching us or listening to us live on Alpha Geek Radio right now. Gentlemen, let's move past that now. Brian, I sent you an email. I need you to open up this email, and there's a video I want you to play. All right, you got I'm it. very very concerned. I have several animal attack stories today to share with you, but also sometimes you, 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 when you watch Breaking Bad, Saul, the character was such a gift. Out of nowhere, we get this wonderful character. When you watch Lost, out of nowhere, this enemy, this guy from Henry Gale becomes this incredibly fascinating personality that drives so much of the story yes. and becomes pretty much the centerpiece of that and goes on to become a lead in his own shows. Hannibal Lecter, you know, is a side character in Red Dragon and then becomes the focus of that series. You get these really, really awesome things. And gentlemen, I want you to watch the story. It's about an owl attacking people. This is the park, Bush Park, in the middle of downtown Salem, where the owl attacks have occurred. And tonight, we managed to find the owl. All of a sudden, my cap was sucked off like a vortex, and uh, it was like a tearing, shearing sensation when, the, when, he, when he latched onto my head. Salem doctor Ron <laughs> Jakes tells me he thought he was having a stroke or an aneurysm when the owl All right, finally... real quick, for the audio listeners, <laughs> um, uh, I, first... Right, go ahead and, and imagine what <laughs> you would see on screen when someone said, Dr. Ron Jakes. Because I think what you might think is a man in a very finely tailored suit, somebody in scrubs maybe, with a, a face mask pulled down to his chin. Brian, can you explain what we're seeing on let's, the screen? Let's start with that image, and then whoever, he's in a white coat, but now we're going to swap out whatever face you thought you saw in there. Let's put Nicolas Cage in there. Uh, let's give him Let's give him a, 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 a Doug Henning hair. And uh, let's if, if let's. Doug Henning were alive today and had a receding hairline. That, that's correct. Uh, let's throw some earrings on him. Let's throw some some uh, Big Lebowski esque stars uh, made of gold in his blazer, his white blazer, and throw him in what looks like a a wrestling getup underneath, like he's wearing spandex. I mean, he very much has a gold lame jumpsuit. 
Uh, yes, very much so. And so, uh, <laughs> so two things about this. When they said this, the first part, I'm like, forget the. That's an amazing story. When you saw, I saw this image. If they didn't tell you what his profession, what would you think this guy was? Oh, Brian dude, he's a magician. Are you kidding me? <laughs> he's either okay. that or a Vegas singer. So. I'm like, this guy, like, and then they say doctor. I'm like, doctor of what? Turns out he's a highly respected surgeon. That is amazing. And, and a magician. Oh, wait, he is a magician. He is a magician. Because I'm like, I'm like, this guy, this guy fell in love with Doug Henning when he was a teenager and never gave that up and became a surgeon. I looked him up, uh, and he's actually a very amazing guy. And that was... The uh, um, Boing Boing, they pointed to the article and they say, you know, they talked about maybe this owl really hates Doug Henning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> so never cool. judge a book. I want to see why he's relevant. Swoop down onto his head, not just once, but twice. Electrical light shock and a really sharp object on the top of my head, like I'd been hit by 30 pounds of force. The barred owl attacked Jake's while he was jogging in Bush Park. I really, I, I very much am jealous of our audio listeners right now because <laughs> they are hearing something entirely normal. Like, like every his tone of voice, his his meter, like his his uh, very even handed and and uh, he's got that that doctor amazing. talk. Yeah, he's got he's got that surgeon doctor talk, that dispassionate clinical way of evaluating exactly what it was he went through. <laughs> Now, I'm sending you the results of a Google image search. This guy may be our new hero. This guy may be our new mascot. By the way, he looks like he should be drawing caricatures on the Las Vegas Strip. Like, that. this is the kind of dude that he looks like, is he would be trying to sell you a, a picture of drawing your niece uh, Doctor, for $30. Dr. Ron Jakes can do no wrong. There's literally nothing he doesn't look good in. We see him <laughs> dressed as, uh, looks like, uh, are these Green Bay Packers uh, uh, superhero clothes he's wearing? Uh, yeah, that looks like, yeah, he is some sort of Packers superhero. He's got a cape. Uh, his his long flowing locks are really the big key there. He also seems to be fond of blouses. Uh, wait, it, it definitely, definitely looks like, uh, like, like uh, he's wearing a, a corset here. Wearing a bustier with like some real nut huggers, <laughs> along with some red, a very looking fairly expensive, like 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 Ferragamo platform shoes. Uh, okay, so this is this is as reported <laughs> with, by the Daily Mail in the UK. It says jogger thought he was struck in the head by lightning, but was actually attacked by an owl. And then they 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 obviously Googled his name and they found these fantastic photos of him dressed as a superhero <laughs> and then owl, and then they showed him in a wonder. Woman style boosty. That's amazing. But wearing man briefs, guys. He's still wearing man briefs. Oh no, they're definitely no. They are they are nut huggers. Yeah. Ah, oh, dude. I I so, wish I was half the man this guy was. I, I I was like, man, this is fascinating. So I looked, you know, I looked him up, and like he's got fantastic reviews. He's a bariatric surgeon. He's a highly regarded surgeon. What an amazing. We should all fulfill our potential in that way and be feel that feel that willing to be who we are we we yeah, absolutely man uh, hats off but, to you dr jakes he, i mean because also uh, doctor as a profession is not without its attention to aesthetics right like there's there's a reason why even as surgeons and as people who make a, a, a living with, with a lot of money and a reputation for doing their job well a lot of doctors dress the same you know like they have similar interests this guy is certainly a cut beyond he's got to be 10 times the doctor he would otherwise be able to be as eccentric as he is and have people still put their bodies in his hands, right? Oh, dude, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Like, I, I would trust him with my, uh, what is bariatric surgery? Yeah, yeah, you know, tell me, you want to lose some weight, you know? Hmm. like Right on. Well, then, uh, yeah, I'd trust him. I, I mean, he looks surgery? great. There that you makes go. a little bit more sense. What's that? Yeah. Plastic surgeon makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. yeah. So we started off with a story. I'm like, this owl that's attacking people. I mean, it's awesome. It's pretty amazing. Um, I was just in Oregon. I guess I should have investigated that, but maybe I wanted to go meet Dr. Jakes. So I'm going to go on a crash course of just nothing but chocolate and Skittles <laughs> and go in there as a patient to uh, get under his confidence, find out, find out the real guy. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> hey, what? There's one thing that is without a doubt. Uh -huh. 
Dr. Jakes knows how to party. You <laughs> find yourself out at 2 in the morning with Dr. Jakes, you are having a night you will never forget. I just, as soon as I saw that image, I'm like, he, he's got to be a magician. He's got to be a magician. Only a magician would dress that way. Look up, magician. Only, like, only magicians then, have access to the secret uh, clothiers who make those things available. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like, and then I'm like, doctor, what's he a doctor of like naturopathic, some sort of wacky Chinese herbal doesn't really work thing? Nope, sturgeon, the realest real doctor you can get. That's but, awesome. But also, if he is a magician, I have a a concept that I think is is true that that magic is thirty people wide and everybody knows everybody. There is no doubt that Doctor Jake's likely knows at least one of you two, if not the both of you. Oh, wow. I didn't even think about that. You know, I, mean, I often, when I encounter some personalities, I'll look up my search. I'll search through my, uh, all of my, like, you know, whoever's, like, to, ordered To see if you've ever run, run across them? And I've had that, right? I've had, oh, somebody ordered this for me, like, eight years ago or whatever. I'm like, ah, oh, interesting. How, um, how's this spelled? J-A-E-K-S? All right. Uh, nope. Yeah, I don't. J A E K E S maybe. Oh, uh, well here I think you just sent it to me. Um, yeah, J E J A E C K S. This is oh. welcome. Welcome to Brian and Andrews. Search their emails. That's well, not a common name. In my... uh, you know what? I do have some Facebook messages from somebody named Colin Jakes. He says that he's my biggest fan. If I would please reply. I mean, listen. You you have to face facts, Brian. That there is a fairly high likelihood. Go ahead, bring up uh, bring up a picture of of of, uh, of Doctor Jake's Doctor Ron, in one of his outfits. Sure. Uh, that that man wrote you or commented online that you shouldn't have spoiled the Invisible Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he's one of the good guys. I think he looks like a progressive free thinker who's you know aware that we live in an age where nobody's going to go to the library. <laughs> So, all right, that guy right there was writing, well, I for one stand with Brian Brushwood. <laughs> yeah, I would like to think that. This vortex of hate. <laughs> yeah. uh, amazing. No, Dr. Ron Jakes, you're the real MVP this week. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, do we want to do a shout out for Patreon before we move on to our next thing? And yeah, we, can get we to should, um, uh, especially as we're at the beginning of, of March, and it it's it's this weird recalibration time at the beginning of the month is when everyone, you know, all their promises come due and they get charged for all the ba various patrons that they're supporting. And, uh, uh, I, it's amazing. My favorite people are the ones who actually tweet out, they screen capture the fact that they got charged and they thank and, and talk about how excited they are at their support. Uh, thank you to all of you guys. We are two thirds of our way to a goal of hitting a thousand per episode. We, so we can, uh, continue to fund our producer and continue to expand with, uh, with projects. And we hope you guys have enjoyed it. Thank you to the 419 people who are keeping us regular. You're the Metamucil to our weird colons. And those of you that are uh, not in there yet, here's the thing: knows we you know we do this other podcast after things now, which became possible because of this. So when you you know it's out there for everybody, but when you're a Patreon, you get the notification when that comes up. And you know that's the thing that's been interesting: is we're getting as much or more emails now about after things as we're getting about weird things. Oh, dude, we've doubled the content, and it's and it's yeah. deep, man. It's inside stuff like you know we're able to talk about the nature of, of creation and our uh, you know how we got started we take we're, we're answering questions now which is my favorite thing do we have yeah. questions going into after things this week um maybe we will by the end of this all right <laughs> uh by the way i think i've got i think i registered after things.com or something like that um no i don't think i got that let me see uh i know that's wrong time for me to be looking at that so <laughs> anyhow uh i did not uh, i was trying to get something else but anyhow my point is gentlemen thank you for everybody supporting us and you know, just thank you for listening just share the words you know if you know if, if, you, if you're not able to support don't want to support that's fine if you like it just tell people you like it yeah we appreciate it anyhow gentlemen Yep. Part of why we're doing this, and we're still, we're still, we want to do our open ROV project. We haven't abandoned the robotic sub thing. We're just trying to uh, uh, figure out the best strategy on that one because we do want to assemble our fleet. But 
Hey, but wanna... before you do the the weird things, like are we are we legally obligated to give a little tip of the hat to the whole dress controversy? Can we agree that that was one of the weirdest oh, yeah. things of the entire week? Yeah, let's uh, we'll do that now instead later. Um, uh, I love so everybody. If, if if you don't know, there was the whole thing this this week. You know, right after the net neutrality, we all get to argue over the color of a dress. I loved this. I loved, 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 loved that a perceptual illusion was the thing everybody talked about to the point of driving everybody nuts because now we have a reference point. We have a reference point about perception, about context and everything. It's in the books. It's one of those things that for years to come, we can all say, remember the day, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, of all of the analyses that, that I saw going around, I was like, I was like, I couldn't make it be the right color and the best explanation. Oh, uh, you're a white gold sh- guy? Uh, well, oh, dude, it was so clearly white gold. And I couldn't make it anything but that. Uh, and then the best link came from uh, one of the friends that you met at the SpaceX uh, aborted launch, a- a Emily Calandrelli, uh, MCAL Space Gal on Twitter, says that she found this New York Times uh, interactive thing that breaks down where they actually take an aggregate of the colors and then they show it in uh based i guess the illusion is based on whether or not you use the contextual clues of the blown out lighting Mm -hmm. in the background to see it as a very brightly washed out black and and blue dress versus a uh you know if it's in shadow then it clearly has to be a white and gold one and then they when they put the two the or the three side by side uh all of a sudden i got it for the first time and Mm -hmm. i and i was like all right i i see now Justin, where were you on this issue? I guess I saw it as more white and gold than I did, uh, of, you know, blue and black. But it took me a while to even understand what the the controversy was because I had seen so many color corrected versions of it. So like I saw stuff that was very plainly white and gold to me, something that was very plainly blue and black to me, and and it was only after like sussing through some of the the outer fringes of everybody yelling on Twitter that I even understood what the issue was. Well, and, and that was the funny part was was to somebody like me who just looked and like it's clearly white and gold. And it's like, you know, because you, you see, uh, you know, you see washed out. I mean, you know, the fact that I'm constantly color correcting in studio, I know that that when the white when the lights are you know, mercury halides or whatever, you know, it's like you get a bluish light. And so it's like, yeah, that's why the white looks so bluish in there because it's in shadow. But uh, I, I, I'm trying, try, but trying so hard to see it is white and gold. And like, really? I mean, I like you, like I play and, you know, I do lots of stuff with like, you know, color bouncing hues and videography and all that sort of stuff and look at that stuff and look, oh, okay, I know this is what it looks like, this shade or whatever, and color temperatures and all this. I cannot see it as white and gold. I cannot see it as white and gold. I, I just, it, I've this, tried and tried. This is the weird thing is I know, like I'm factually, demonstrably wrong. Looking at it, I can't, I still can't see it as anything but white and gold. That's a, that's amazing to me because like I've had, like, because like for me, it's like, I like, I'm like, it's, black and blue it's black. i mean my first response was i had a girl text me in the morning she goes what does this look like to you and it was a different photo of a woman wearing the dress and i said a size 16 <laughs> 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 and then and then once then but i'm like it's black and blue i mean it was like just, just to me i'm like and then i'm like and then she's like really i'm like yeah. oh my god i mean if Wait. it was a guy i'd be like well you're colorblind but yeah. no well, i mean no, it's the, like the, girls the, probably see color better than we do but it was just weird that she just her mind was blown, and then I'm talking I believe to other it was two thirds of the audience. What's weird right now, huh? Is like I'm looking at, and and, and the way that like Skype works mm-hmm. is put a little window when you're not clicked on it in the corner, right? And in the smaller format, the thumbnail of it, it looks like the big version of the dress to me is white and gold, but it is almost clearly blue and black in my top in my little in the thumbnail. Where it's blend blended together. That's amazing. Where I guess like the shadow is more concentrated, and now I can very much see it as blue and black. Man, I uh, uh, I, I wonder. Uh, this has to be like a gold mine uh, for, to have this many respondents nice. to respond to it, uh, and and to be able to break across across gender, across region, across uh, socio economic strata. Like like because 
like for whatever it is, the 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 background visual clues. Because here's the thing: is I suspect. Let's try this. I suspect if you isolated out just the dress and took out all of the. Oh, it's not going to let me do that. Um, hmm. I guess I can take some other. Did you see the things? XKCD illustration, by the way? No, 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 no. Let me, let go, me go to XKCD.com right now. Sure, 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 sure. XKCD. But, but I mean, so everybody who's, who's nauseated by the discussion as it's gone on for so it is, it's a wonderful thing because to have as a reference point this thing, it means a lot for science, as Brian's talking about, to have millions of people respond. And then you can, now you get to go in front of an audience if you want to explain the stuff, say, how many of you saw the gold dress or the white and gold? How many of you saw the black and blue dress? And you see this perception, and the fact that it's so sharp, and it's, it came out of nowhere. It just came out of nowhere is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, TV I have a friend guns. that was in his late 50s before he realized he was colorblind. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, TV Zegon is forwarding us over uh, an article that mentions the claim that blue is a fairly recent invention is that is that is that for real it's been debunked yeah okay i thought so because I, I i listened to like the radio lab where they were talking about uh talking about how in the iliad it talks about the wine dark sea and it never mentions the word blue and therefore it's like well there's no such thing as blue until recently yeah no i mean that that also you know could be that homer was colorblind <laughs> You know, um, sure. yeah, I mean, you've had, there have been a lot of different colors. Blue is one of the, was always one of the hardest colors to create artificially blue. But if you want to see blue, look at the damn sky. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, and, and describing the sea is like, yeah, the sea is a lot of different colors, you know. You mean um, the gold white sky? Great. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, no, this was, uh, you know, this was was on Saturday Night Live last night. I mean, if we were going to use that as a cultural yard marker for, uh, you know, everybody being in on it, this was this was a a, a huge, gigantic thing, arguably bigger than than uh, you know the FCC ruling, which everybody thought was going to be kind of the big news of the day, wound up uh, to kind of taking a bronze medal that day between what color the dress was and llamas getting loose in Arizona. Yeah, I didn't even see the llamas one. I guess it was kind of like a balloon boy thing where everyone was freaking out to watch them happen in live or? Uh, yeah, I, it was, you know, just the fact that a, a news station decided to use all the resources that they would normally use for a car chase to watch two llamas run around. So <laughs> equal part spectacle and kind of adorable and then also had a little bit of that you know, Felix Bumgardner, like, is somebody going to run over these llamas and we'll all be horrified by it? But it, it, it all ended well. Uh, yeah. And just, just for reference, like, just want to quick on the whole the blue didn't exist. I mean, yeah, it's, it was just hard to recreate it. Now, you look in King Tut's funeral mask, you'll find examples of blue and you'll find lapis lazuli, lazuli uh, other, word, other terms. Um, there are examples. It's just, it is technically, it's a hard thing because you don't, you look in organic nature blue occurs but it's it's rare blue rare. dyes didn't come about too much later yeah so uh, but there was woad other stuff so gentlemen yo what um i've got a body in a morgue uh yeah can, can we can we poke it can i, I see need it? spiro and fudge can poke it uh well you know, i can poke it with a little fudge i got it right here poke it with the stick hey, hey fudge fudge look i'm poking a body with the stick Spiro, right, right. calm down. Right. Gentlemen. Listen, um, there's a body. We got to solve the case. All right. I'm the, uh, I'm the monosyllabic syllabic corner, and yeah. uh, I hate my job. <laughs> I'll give you a few answers. And, and uh, a monosyllabic you're gonna, corner. You're, you're going to need – what's that? Real chatty for a monosyllabic corner. <laughs> <laughs> it's a statement I gave at the very beginning, and then I'm going to shut actually, up. It's actually it. a laminated card he just handed us. That, yeah. that, that technically yeah. uh, we're Point reading is, this in our minds. You're, you're going to start here, but you're going to have to take this investigation out here. I'm going to kick you out, too, because you're going to have to go into the field, too, at some point. But we're going to start with the body on the slab. Um, the circumstances. We're more curious, curious about the circumstances. It's not really cause of death, because I might just tell you that outright. Okay. Should, I mean, I'll tell you the physical cause. I mean, I mean first, uh, 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 the body's intact. We're able to see facial, facial features and everything? Yeah. All right. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's male? Yeah. A uh, young male under thirty. No, I, right. Like I said, an old man, like over fifty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know what? You have some fudge. Color is he? Blue and black, white and gold. 
Oh, you got the stare from the coroner. Oh, the fudge pissed off the coroner. <laughs> uh, so, pissed is two words, so he can't say it. <laughs> uh, is it? I, I is it? I, I I don't know how to phrase this, but um, is, in the most offensive way possible. You you've seen him naked, right? Yeah. Do you, do you see any holes in him? Like obvious, like you know, holes. Uh, yeah, several. Okay, all right. Gunshots? No. Hmm. Pitchforks? No. I, 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 was was he I, I, nostrils I, mouth oh oh yeah right, right, right any any holes that weren't there before he died no okay what about was he found was he found out in the open or was he found in his home no was uh, was he within 10 miles or 20 miles of home maybe okay all right so so in his local what town to the morton Oh, say it again, Justin. How many hours ago was he brought to the morgue? Five. All right, so we got a fresh one. Uh, was was he was the body discovered by someone? Like like, or, or was the body discovered within say six hours of its death? Yeah. Okay. So reason. What was the person there at the time of death? The person the deceased? Who, uh, no, 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 no. The person who discovered the body. Were, were, were there yes. witnesses? Were there witnesses to the death? Yes. Okay. Was it more than five witnesses? Maybe. Okay. Where did he die? Lake. Oh, oh. Was was he attacked? What? Was he on a boat? Yes. Was he attacked by a wild animal? Maybe. Is he wearing gold lame and have awesome uh, Doug Henning hair? Stupid. <laughs> uh, all right, coroner. At what time specifically did the giant river snake leap from the river and kill this man? Huh. <laughs> nope. Snakes. Nice try. Nice try. Uh, Here, come on. This is a, like like nine of our cases have been snakes. Is is it? A, look, I mean, by the numbers, I think it's a great it's a, it's a it's a great algorithm you got going. Good heuristic. With snake. Yeah. Uh, was was his death unusual? <laughs> Why am I even asking that? Uh, was it was it supernatural? Is it solved? That's what I want to know. Do they know what killed him? Heart attack. It was a heart attack? But he's got... Mm. Mm -hmm. Why are we brought in? So he's out there on a boat. All of a sudden, he has a heart attack and dies. Gets brought right to the morgue. <laughs> what the hell do they need uh, two world-class detectives? Or one world-class detective and his bizarre sidekick to solve it for? <laughs> cause. Oh, the, ca the cause of death or just because? I just gave you the same question. God dang it. Uh, um, did he have a history of heart ailments? No, barely. Was he alone in the boat? No. Was, uh, okay. So we no, know that go talk to the other person in the boat. Yeah, can we leave? I think we're just going to leave this guy. He was found, heart attack. Bye. <laughs> See ya, Monosola. Man. I heard. I sure hope that when we go to to investigate the people who are on the boat, that they're not also curmudgeons who are very monosyllabic in their answers. Or at least after they go on a monologue for like thirty minutes and then only say five words afterward. Bizarre. Oh, it's setting the scene, gentlemen. No. Just say. Uh, all right, so let's go. We, we go and we find the person that was on the boat with him. I'm the boat captain. What's going on? Uh, hey, uh, what, did he rent your boat? Did, did you he like charter it? Maybe. The, the, okay. Uh, well, is it everybody in this town with the monosyllabic stuff? Come on. We're related. Yeah, no, they're all they're all part of the big family. <laughs> uh, 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 it was uh, it was a group of people. It's a charter. Oh, 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 had a bunch of people on my boat. Brother. Uh, and w were you guys just out for fun, or were you looking for something? Yeah. <laughs> were you fishing? Um, 
little, little maybe. Uh, maybe throw some cats long, and some wine and stuff, you know. You already asked this. Uh, was it just you two? Uh, there was a few other people on the boat. And like a family. His family was on the boat. His uh, family was on the boat. How how long were you guys out for? A few hours. It was a bit of a bit of a bit of a trip. A bit of a, a day trip. So a, what was uh, what was this guy doing right before he had the heart attack? Just sitting there. Nothing else. <laughs> nope. Did 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 it appear that he was infested with parasites? And then did he lean back and sort of scream, "Oh God, it's happening!" And then like um, worms crawled out of his eyes and consumed his flesh. We didn't notice at first what happened. We're a bit distracted. You know, I just took a real quick nap on, on the floor of the boat. Uh, well, I, no, it doesn't sound like he fell down at all. He, he Did he look like he was alive for a long time after he died? We weren't sure until we got in the hospital and realized he was dead. Uh, was he moving? Not when he was dead. They don't tend to move when they're dead. Okay. You should well, talk to my I brother. Mean, I'm the, just the wondering why. He'll tell you that. Yeah. This seems like a real fishy situation, no pun intended, since you're on a boat. What were you guys on the hunt for? Uh, you know, there are a lot of sights to see around here. You know, a lot of were historical things. Were you guys doing things. anything illegal? No, no, no. We just it's a, lot, it's a lot of historical things to see and stuff. A lot of history here. So A lot of history? What, 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 what kind wait. of... Huh? It's a balloons? Wait, th- this is a lake? Uh, wait, where are we? What part of the... Uh, point on the map where we are. Um, we're in Europe. Wait a minute, are we in Loch Ness? Not right at this moment, we're not, <laughs> but maybe the boat was at Loch Ness. <laughs> you're in Loch Ness, and you're looking for the Loch Ness monster, aren't you? Come on. There are other things to see there, too. We do tours, and it's not just to go see the Loch Ness monster, you know? Uh, come on, What's dude. Let's see. Uh, why does your business card say, come see the Loch Ness Monster or your money back? Uh, we don't offer the money back. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta read the fine print, you know. <laughs> so, okay, all right. So they show up. Uh, is this guy an American? It was, he was a tourist. He, uh, he decided to take the family. They just wanted to go see the beautiful Loch Ness with its coffee-colored waters, hoping to spot themselves uh, 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 a giant, uh, I don't know, diplodocus or whatever it is that's in the water. And uh, <laughs> all I can think of is uh, uh, Apex's tree fitty uh, comment in the chat where he's from South Park. What's that? <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, and, so, and so what? He dies in the boat... From what? He was scared. Wait, he had a heart attack because he thought... He thinks he saw the Loch Ness Monster, had a heart attack, and died. Well, in his defense, when we hit it, it was pretty traumatic. Wait. When you hit the Loch Ness Monster, and did you hit with the boat the Loch Ness Monster like it was a poor manatee. And, and you, you what? You shouted, holy crap, we hit... Loch Ness, we killed Nessie, and you, the trauma gave him a heart attack? Um, ah, listen, we don't know when he had the heart attack. All we know is we hit it, and we had to pull into port, and we look at the boat, and we, for, we realize he's dead, and I look at the damage of the boat, and there's all this flesh attached to the propeller in the boat. And, you oh know, we found God. flesh and black skin an inch thick along the f- prop shaft. Well, uh, uh, oh. Wow, okay. I mean, have you have you tested the 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 flesh to figure out what it belonged to? Did it? Did you kill Nessie? The Are you workers positive threw it that away. The flesh the, wasn't white. <laughs> the was bur- the workers, the dock workers, threw it away. I was upset, you know, because uh, obviously that was the proof of Nessie. Uh, hold on, hold on. So you had black flesh. You be you hit something. You come back. Your boat's uh, uh, broken on some level because of the impact. Next thing you know, the dock workers are throwing the flesh away into the, the, the garbage bin? Well, we had an old dead guy in our boat who was so what traumatized you, by what happened. What, <laughs> so what are you, you going to throw story. him away next? What is this it with is, you people? This is from the Scotland Now Daily Record. And this happened four years ago. The guy says he's taking some people out on the boat, and they hit something. They, hit, they had a collision with something. 
And you know, the old the grandfather had a heart attack, and then they took him to the hospital and realized he died. They get the boat into you know to look at examine the boat, and they find flesh. And there's supposed to be numerous encounters with Loch Ness monster people colliding with it. And this one, this guy said, "Yeah, we actually had bits of Loch Ness monster flesh, which sounds a lot like seal flesh." Just saying, but are there are there right? seals? I assume there are seals in in Loch Ness, right? Yeah, seals. I think so. Loch Ness searching. Uh, yeah, look, look at this, man. We got images of seals in Loch Ness mm -hmm. right there. Wow, they look kind of like the famous Loch Ness monster, <laughs> right? <laughs> Shockingly. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so uh, it sounds to me like they ran over a seal. I'm just saying. But you know, the, the way the story gets told is you know, somebody was so scared and traumatized by what happened, they had a heart attack right then and there. That's, yes. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I wonder how much I wonder how much of the um, uh, oh my gosh I've never seen this breakdown of I remember that famous image of Nessie that the guy on his deathbed um, confessed to uh, a surgeon's uh, photo. Uh, yeah, oh because it's rumored like that it's supposed to be just a toy sub, but I'm looking at this right now. Uh, but it looks like somebody's envisioning an entire <laughs> Nazi U boat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like with people down below at scale. That's amazing. That was like that Sherlock Holmes movie where they like you know the the Germans were like secretly building a submarine for the Loch Ness because it was such a strategic thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now like it's a surgeon's photo. A surgeon's photo. Above all right? reproach, that surgeon. You're calling him a liar. Yeah, That's let's go ahead and bring up Dr. Jakes's photo and say surgeon's <laughs> photo. <laughs> <laughs> I so, just, you know, uh, that was a long way to get around to what I thought was a very interesting, unusual Loch Ness monster story involving Loch Ness monster well, flesh. Oh, well, here was my question: was Unless how, he's killed, how, how big? Oh man, that's uh, now we have to avenge. We have to destroy this beast. <laughs> this a murderous beast. Let's kill what we don't understand. <laughs> it sounds like I say we send Doctor Jack, Jake's, and Al. <laughs> I say I say we drop a nuke in Loch Ness just because that'd be cool to watch explode. Yeah, it's very aggressive, Brian. Um, do you want to do picks? Do you have time for one more time? One more? Uh, no, I got time. All right, I want to show you something. I want to show you something, gentlemen. The world we live in is. Very, very strange. I gotta pull up. Um, the link to this image. Uh, I don't want to panic, you guys, but I think the sky is falling. Wait, well, well, I mean, stuff falls from the sky all the time. If, if in so far as you define the sky as everything above the earth, then yeah, it's falling towards us all the time. Brian, that's just crazy talk. Point <laughs> is, I'm gonna send you a link to this. Um, I'm trying to find. Um, I'm going to show you an image here, Brian. Yep, yep. Oh, here it comes. All right. No, oh, uh, uh, the the shocking uh, reversal of the cam from from Andrew. He is now pointing it to his computer, and what we see is a streak, a comet-like streak in in the night sky, maybe a dusk kind of sky, and it is certainly pink in nature. To well, it looks like the red comet from uh, the Game of Thrones series until that was utterly forgotten as a portent. Yeah, that was, right? Yeah, they sort of just dropped it. They were like, ah, there's definitely a red comet in the sky, and then they're yeah. like, whatever. Well, this is no comet, gentlemen. Giant red blob in the sky. Oh, wait, so it's a whole blob. So that wasn't just that it was out of focus, uh, because it did look like something was mid-streak and had a trail behind it. It was a glow of a red glow. Uh, okay, now uh, you've already removed the picture, so I'm going by memory, but I seem to remember it was in the very end of dusk, right? Um, yeah, it may have been dusk-like or sometime at dusk or some nighttime or, or maybe, whatever. Or maybe Just morning. Or th this kind of stuff happens all the time with, with, with discolorations in the sky, although normally it's far more uniform. You know, out here, I, I think I've, I've woken up to or, or had at dusk you know, very pink or orangey, uh, unnatural looking skies. Well, if, if, uh, I, if I was going to guess, this is like right before the sun, you know, in the, in dusk, after the sun is down and you kind of feel like it should be <coughs> night, you can get, especially if it's largely a cloudless sky, and then you have one cloud that's just in that right position, it just looked like it's just randomly on fire, or, or even like if it's a little 
piece of a cloud. It'll look like a little UFO or something. Is is that what this is? No, no, hmm. Brian. It's not was what it is. In a train from space. This was a. This was like a, you looked up. You saw this reddish glow. This weird reddish glow in the sky. And it wasn't obviously a cloud. And it, it must have been a local phenomenon or we would have heard about it across the planet, right? Yeah. It so, was relatively local. So I, I, is, is it a meteor? Uh, but but it, you said it wasn't a meteor. No, no. It was, it was still in the sky. Where, where was this local to? This was uh, – uh, let me pull this up. Um, let me see where this one – New Mexico, um, I think this fo- photo was from New Mexico, southern New Mexico. Uh, Ma- this photo was taken from Mesa, Arizona. Huh. So, so it's big. Oh, wait, wait, C- could it have been? Well, no, we don't do nuclear testing anymore, so it couldn't be. I mean, could it be munitions of some variety? Electric charge and some whatever? Could it be a, a clarify a question for me, Brian? I don't know, like uh, some kind of weapons testing thing, you know. Not a weapons test that we know of. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is a solved mystery of of the hanging red cloud, right? Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, can, can I see it again? It looks it looks like it was. I'm sending you uh, the article, and you'll actually get the explanation for it. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is really cool. So imagine you're out there and you see this weird, mysterious red glow, and you're like, "What the hell is that?" And the funny part is, is there's not a lot of coverage of it, and so I could see, and like even trying to go to the source of it, it comes to it leads to a Facebook page without a lot of information there. Wow! One day after a Chinese rocket disintegrated brightly over the western USA, another set of strange lights appeared over the same region. This time, it was NASA's doing. Before sunrise on February 25th, a Terrier Black Brant Research rocket lifted up from White Sands Missile Range in southern New Mexico, carrying an experiment to Earth's ionosphere. Vapors released by the rocket created a luminous blob in the dawn, dawn sky, shown here. That's that's Wait, amazing. That's like that's that's NASA's graffiti. They're yeah, like yeah. tagging the sky. Yeah, uh, that's that's it's, astonishing. It looks, uh, man. Uh, there's different photos of it, but see it all the way in Utah, apparently. Wow, and so this is all. I guess essentially, you know, in the 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 ionosphere is where the what the northern lights are, right? Because uh, uh, normally it gets excited by <laughs> solar radiation, and you get um, uh, aurora. So this is kind of like an aurora. Dude, I'll tell you what, Max Ammo's got it. Up your nose, Banksy. Like, this is this is some next-level stuff. It was, they say the total amount of material they used, it, the ionized gla- gas, uh, would have fit in a propane tank that, you know, used for a barbecue grill. Wow. Just that much, and it creates that big of a glow. And 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 this is not a reflection. It's an actual glow. That's huge. Yeah, it's actual glow. Actual glow. Actual, uh, it's a plasma. It's like one of those little glow globes. So, all right, let's imagine a world where because SpaceX has revolutionized rocket technology, it's now very cheap. Could you see, like, a world in which people are augmenting the sky that shines over their city or town or state? Well, there, there was talk about, uh, I, I want to say that France was talking smack. I, I remember I was in uh, seventh grade at the time reading, you know, some like 321 Contact magazine. And there was talking about like in celebration of some 100th or 200th anniversary of being French as hell, France was going to. Uh, Three, two, one. <laughs> Contact. It's, it's the, the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Everything comes to. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And now we're going to sing the Bloodhound Gang. But, dude, I was about to look up the Bloodhound Gang. <laughs> Whatever. There's trouble. We're there on the double. Uh, so there was talk about them sending up just like for a while, just to have something, you know, to be all like, hey, look at what we can do. They were going to uh, fling up and inflate a ring, an inflatable ring that would be as bright as the full moon hanging up there in front of the world because it was just, it was going to be so much closer to the earth and it wouldn't take a lot of mass because they were just going to inflate it and to become like just a giant ring thing. I mean, I would love to see, let me, let me look this up and see if the, if, if that's but crazy. Talk. Like, all right. So number one, you would have to take something universally pleasing to, like, to even be a conversation. If you were to have some sort of, you know, for like maybe 4th of July, 
you know, you put up a little American flag in the sky or something like that. Well, oh, yeah, to show the, the United States' global domination over the entire planet. That's a, that's, that will be universally pleasing. This was, this was regional to Arizona as far as Utah, right? Right. Uh, oh, so you're saying like to, to, to do like a firework that dissipates. You're not saying send up an actual thing that the whole universe can see. Not to do a big American flag that all the world can see. <laughs> that's what I thought you were saying. No, no, no. I'm just saying that. All right. So let's say rocket stuff is cheaper, you know, and this is like a, a, this would be the, the next level of maybe a fireworks display. Ooh, so. Man, dude, uh, uh, that's delightful that, that you think that people are going to spend, you know, thousands of dollars to send up uh, just a firework display. Personally, this this has ads written all over it. Well, I think like like if China were to host the Olympics again, they'd do it. You know, the next big Olympic sort of thing. I see that happening. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is if it's worth doing it there, then it's worth it's skywriting, like ultimate skywriting, yeah. seen by an entire yeah, country. The, the biggest thing is if 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 you're interfering with like telescopes and any sort of scientific thing or anything like that, and you're doing that, your your brand will get so criticized, so yelled at. You know, I mean, GoDaddy will do it, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying nobody will do it. I'm just saying it's it's the This is something there is a permanence to launching a rocket to do something that even like, maybe even just in the short term I think affects our understanding of whether or not it's a cool thing to do unless it's kind of a purely altruistic mm-hmm. purpose, you know? Like uh, I feel like skywriting has an impermanence to it that even if you're annoyed by it by the time that you would go to the you know the police to call you know like get this is terrible it's already gone you know well I mean it sounds like that's the case for this it didn't stick around for more than a couple of hours yeah unless, no, unless I understand I, yeah I think I think if you could figure out a way to do it and it's temporary and you know I think absolutely um, gentlemen you want to do what? picks let's do picks let's do picks who wants to go first to picks mm. I I mean I, I got one ready if that's the question. Uh, wait, except for I totally don't. I'm going to have to read it off my phone. Um, the, uh, man, I keep doing more of the great courses on Audible. You know, one of the things that, uh, I remember that the great courses used to be like, you know, hundred dollars a piece and they'd come on cassette tapes and there was all this infrastructure or whatever. Like, I don't know what kind of Satan's bargain they did with Audible, but I love the fact that they're just one Audible credit. The one I'm doing right now is, uh, 24 segments long. So uh, it's a big one. Each one, each segment's about a half hour long. Uh, hosted and I assume written by Professor Stephen Novella. You ever hear of him? Yep. Uh, host, among others, of uh, the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. He did a fantastic, great course called Your Deceptive Mind, a scientific guide to critical thinking skills. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, uh, Andrew. But uh, uh, folks like the three of us, we, we've been around a bit for um, in the skeptic uh, circles, and we've learned a lot about the ways the brain can fool itself. So in many ways, this is sort of a greatest hits of, you know, so much of it is, is material that I've read over the last four or five years or, or beyond, but it's awesome to get a refresher on it. For example, you know, all of thinking fast and slow will show up in basically a 20 minute segment, you know, give or take. And so I'm like, oh, that's right. They did do that test and you can manufacture this. And, oh, I do know that illusion. It really does cause you to think that. No, yeah, no, I do have that. You know, I do remember learning about that cognitive bias. Uh, you know, he talks about everything from, you know, the, the Barnum effect to, uh, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I'm really, as far as the greatest hits of not being judgmental about what is and isn't possible in, uh, the supernatural or what is and isn't pseudoscience, but so much as explaining why the brain insists on categorizing things, you know, much like I'm sure if this were to come out, you know, uh, tomorrow, it would in- involve the, uh, the white, gold, blue, black dress illusion in there but i'm enjoying Mm. it quite a bit very cool i i try to finish a book before i recommend it but i'm almost like like 10 pages away from finishing this book so i'm gonna go ahead and recommend it and i'm gonna give you a little background though before i get into the specifics of this uh often you know we live in a very very interesting time where you have people who've gone from commenting on things evolving technology etc and then participating in it and it used to be kind of like you know, if you're a writer, you're going to be a writer. You know, if you're going to be this, this is sort of what you did. You look for things sort of around that area, and your expertise 
maybe if you were a covered politics, you knew a lot about, you were a good writer and you could cover it, maybe you might become a speech writer. You know, maybe you might become, maybe a, maybe a lobbyist or something like that. Your movements laterally were within an area, but there weren't a lot of them that you could do. There's a writer who I've read some of his books before, and uh, he's a magazine writer, uh, editor, and who's written a lot about technology. And as he's covered this more and more, he's built up a pretty good knowledge base and then put some of these that went from analyzing other people's ideas to starting to put his own ideas into play. And I'm talking about Chris Anderson, whose book I mentioned last week, Free, a really good book where he talked about you know the the whole idea of the free economy and you know, a good insight into it. And he also wrote for The Long Tail, etc. His newest book right there, Makers, which came out a year ago. Makers is all about the new industrial revolution, about how people are able to build things, you know, on their own, build things smaller groups, and talks about everything from Local Motors, which is this company, a, you know, a car company where you participate in building a car and they design their own custom car machines to, you know, the people behind Square, how Jack Dorsey and his partner there, you know, built the own little the Square device that then powered, made it easy to turn your iPhone into a credit card terminal. A bunch of different stories talking about people launching stuff on Kickstarter. Back then, Pebble had just launched as he wrote this on, uh, had just launched, they hadn't delivered a product yet, but he, so he talks about that. He also talks about his own company, his own experience, where he started creating drones, like these different kinds of drones, and started an open source drone project where people could contribute designs to it, and then eventually they decided they would start manufacturing them. He brought somebody on board to help him out with this. And so if you read this guy's books, he went from a writer talking about this interesting thing going on and experimenting, like in the book Free, making it free, to then creating his own open source hardware company, RoboDrone which just now got a $50 million investment wow. uh, from investors looking to expand. He's got over 200 employees, and this is the guy that was the, I think, and maybe he still is, he's a you know the, the writer for uh, Wired Magazine. Editor-in-Chief of Wired in 2012. Yeah. Until 2012. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, oh, uh, you know what, I have to, uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm distracted because I'm literally trying to spend audible credits on this right this second, but yeah. I realized. And I'm it's interesting because he talks about, he gets into the idea that he started this, he started 3D Robotics, 3D, or excuse me, uh, started this company to start producing, developing, go to 3DRobotics.com to create their own sort of, he, he and his kids were playing on Legos one day and the kids got bored with Legos and then they had a, a remote control airplane, which didn't fly very well, but then he was thinking about trying to combine like the Mindstorm sort of things with the plane and try to create its own autopilot, and that evolved, and other people liked this idea, and they started contributing, and the next thing you know, he has a large group of people helping develop this hardware. He starts to manufacture, and he, he wants to manufacture, and he gets some great suggestions from some person he's never met, says this person's great, ends up partnering this person, and this person ends up becoming the CEO of his company, or running the factories, or you know, becoming the head of the company, the person he started collaborating with was a 19-year-old Mexican immigrant living in Riverside, California, with his mother. You know, and his like girlfriend. He just got pregnant. Okay? Wow! And and just and Anderson partnered them because he had the knowledge. Not didn't matter degrees, didn't matter background, because this kid had the knowledge. And now uh, that's Jordi Munoz. Uh, you know, is running this with him because they formed a group online and started collaborating. And it's just an amazing story about how I think that's the best part about the book is you realize now that, that 3D Robotics has become a very viable, powerful company. And it's Chris Anderson putting his ideas to the test, not just writing about, hey, I think this is kind of cool or this is an interesting sort of thing that's going on. He's a guy that once he found his passion, because he just the thing he would love to do for free, the thing he loved to do every day, which is play around with drones and robots and stuff like that, and then participate in online movements, he was able to create an amazing company that's got offices in Austin, Tijuana, Berkeley, San Diego. I'll tell you what, man, uh, that thing you said about uh, about him not having any idea that the kid was 19 years old or any of that, like all he cared about is the kid knew his stuff. Uh, and that's one of the wonderful things that the Internet brings us is this curtain, whereas, uh, you know, pre-Internet, I mean, it's how ridiculous does it seem to interview people one at a time and make a gamble based on some paperwork that they have, that they're probably somebody who knows their stuff. Uh, nowadays, you know, we just hosted a contest on 99designs.com for uh, for an upcoming project on scam stuff 
And uh, I, I don't know the nationality. I don't know the age. I don't know the gender. I don't know anything about the winning entry except for that I loved it and that they're going to continue to that 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 we that they won the purse and now we're going to have we're going to pay them more to design the rest of the project. And it's like it's amazing how how efficient it makes all that possible. And it's great. And Chris Anderson went from literally his kitchen table with his kids to now and as Qualcomm put in fifty million dollars investment into the company it was already. And they went. He talked about the evolution of going from like how do you go from you know small assembly to large assembly. It is a if you have any interest in one making things, inventing things, anything like that. I highly, highly, highly recommend this book, and it, it, it's it's the the best testament to it is where you look at Anderson's passion, following him like you know listen to him talk about three D robotics and other companies and this oh the side thing he's doing. It's like huh, what a flight of whimsy, Anderson. Guess what? Now it's a real big thing, and he's head of a very big robotics company. Absolutely. A journalist. A journalist of all of people. All people. Of all people. Uh, all right. My pick is the Daily Tech News Show, which you might have heard with uh, Tom Merritt. He, uh, th- there are, it's a great show every, every day uh, that, that you can listen to it. However, I do believe that he is uh, very much in his element and is very important for issues like the net neutrality uh, uh, thing that happened this week. Uh, it, it's, it's really a kind of sober look at uh, these like very, very important issues beyond just sort of people you know, posting gifts either in anger or in delight uh, about it. So uh, I was uh, thankfully a part of the episode uh, after they made the announcement. I was very uh, excited to do it, but uh, I think that it is a a great daily list. Cool, right very on. Cool. A sober look. Was that a slam against Brian? Probably. Oh. Uh, wait, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the uh, uh, no, yeah, to be clear, it's like uh, in fact, um, uh, full disclosure. Uh, Tom has asked me. Uh, the only reason that he didn't get into more detail is because the FCC hasn't actually released all the net neutrality stuff. <laughs> oh, uh, that- yeah, and and he called me and he's like, "Hey, how short of notice do you need to come on Daily Tech News Show uh, when when this comes out?" And I was like, "An hour." So uh, at some point, whenever they release it, you know, he he asked me, you know, because obviously we talk about a lot of this on Cord Killers, and um, you know, and you know, I I seem to have made a name for myself for the one guy. I don't know, obviously not the one guy. But whatever, I I say I will probably be less thrilled with the FCC ruling than the rest of the world is what I'm saying. Well, Brian, that's because you're not acting purely on emotion. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the biggest thing, and this it's what I think he does on that show very very well is that it's I think there is nobody that has served for you know, everybody screaming yub nub and jumping up and down for something that we have no idea what it is, you know, and, and, and there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And, and, you know, I think that, that if for anybody who watched the actual FCC discussion of it, uh, I don't think that there were really for however disingenuous you might find the positions of Verizon or, or Comcast. And, and believe you me, I, I have very strong feelings about how they have brought a lot of this upon themselves. Uh, but there are, you know, there are, are some real issues here that I think, uh, you know, deserve to be explored. And I think, uh, daily tech news show is a great format mm-hmm. to do that beyond just the hyperbole of like, we won when we don't really know who we are <laughs> and what we've won and, and what the, the, the debate really is. Well, can I tell you, you made a Chris rock rock reference about that. And I, I have a, I have an Amazon echo by the way. And randomly that, that Chris Rock segment came up and out of nowhere, I was listening to music. All of a sudden this, this Chris Rock, you know, what did we win thing came up? I'm like, this is funny. The Chris Rock. And I think it's the, the bring the pain special talking about, uh, uh black people during the OJ, uh, oh. thing. Like, <laughs> what? like what the F did we win? I didn't get an OJ check in the mail. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, and sneak preview of the kind of thing I'm going to talk about on, on Daily Tech News shows. There's an FCC chart that uh, that uh, where the FCC summarizes uh, Internet access uh, from uh, 2009 to 2012. And it's like the reason everyone wants net neutrality is because we just don't want our crap to be slow or choked or whatever. But but we're entering a world where you could see this geometric progression of, of low bandwidth cellular connections going down, 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 uh, high bandwidth going up, up, up. And it, it's it's just... It's connected America. I don't know. We live in a world where everything is trending to free in terms of bandwidth, in terms of storage, and in terms of computing power. And uh, soon with the 3D revolution, with you know, it's just so much. Why why lock into stone now yeah, after I, this was relevant? We 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 all want the same thing. I think our 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 hesitation comes from our experience and seeing how plans put in place to give us those things end up giving us the opposite. And that's the fear is that, that yes, this, yes, 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 yes. Want, 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 want. Historically, yeah. it doesn't work. Well, out and plus way. also they, they, they tend to squeeze out the smaller guy. It tends to, yeah. uh, uh, to chill, uh, young starry eyed entrepreneurs from diving into it because, uh, you know, who can play the regulation game, you know, how to, how to work, you know, not so much bribes, but lobbying efforts are the entrenched, uh, big, rich variety. The exact people you hate are, are now going to be in a better position to play the inside Washington game. And it's going to be harder for outsiders to come in and break that. So yeah, there's well, a reason there's only been three American car companies in the last 50 years. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. Um, and, gentlemen. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. I think we're ready to wrap this up and move into after things. Yeah. So how's it been? It's been weird. All right. So 50, 58 minutes exactly. Nesh is where uh, is where that was. Uh, you want you want to just dive right in? Uh, I could use a restroom break. Okay. I'm with you. Uh, you know what? Let me let me double check with the uh, wife and kids. Hey, why what color is my? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's what, we got some comments on that. Uh, title. Let's ask Andrew when he gets back. Yeah. Let's throw this on there a little bit. This, unless you want it. Wait. Oh my God! It's a Rob Crackle. What's going on, buddy? What's up, dude? How are you? I'm doing good, man. Yeah. You know, what brings you up to the to the Bay Area? Uh, in town for GDC. GDC's all this oh, week. Oh, yeah. What, what, you think just because you uh, work on some of the best games in the world, you belong at GDC? Uh, sure. Uh, dude, uh, man, I all I want to do is ask you what you're working on, but of course that's what you can't say. Oh, no, I'm working on Uncharted 4. It's announced. Oh, it is. Great. Well, congratulations, man. I'm very excited. I, uh, I've really enjoyed... I, I made the mistake of putting the... P and by the way... You are the one who converted, but like there came a time I was either going to buy an Xbox or a PS4 and, uh, and, and I, I still have not gotten an Xbox one, but, but we've been playing the hell out of the PS4. And as a side effect of all that, like we play four player, uh, Raymond legends with the whole family, which is like Bonnie is playing the PS4. And that's something I never thought I would see in my entire life. So all, all of this is to say the only, the, the only downside to all this is that, uh, having the PS4 in the living room means that I haven't been playing uh, uh, th through the remastered version of The Last of Us, which makes me sad because I, I got through like the beginning of it and I was like, oh, I'll keep playing. But then, you know, in the room where all the children are, they're not so yeah, excited you. about it. I'm back. Yeah. All right. Now you can talk to Rob Crackle. Ah! Go. <laughs> A different bearded man sitting in this chair. That's right. Justin's on his way back. Wait, you're not Justin? I'm so confused. <laughs> Good. You should. He needs a little 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 scare in his life. Yeah. Uh so Justin, did did, did I show you this? Uh no. A little rubber band shooter? R remember the uh the Wolverine claw? Yeah. I call it the snick. This is the thwoop. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Little thing I invented. Dude, you're going nuts, man. You're, yeah, you're... so it was the, the mechanism. That's amazing. Yeah. Printed it up myself, designed it in Tinkercad, you know. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, for you know what's better than one 3D printer? Four? Yeah, I think uh, 
I'm at two. I've got space for a third. I went over to you saw the setup, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go. Uh, hold on. That's I've awesome. The, yeah, I've got all the uh, all of my different filaments up there. Went to IKEA, got a slide out table, little little assembly area and stuff. Uh, Nesh comes looking for a title for the episode. Oh, uh, uh, I don't want to give away. I was going to say Loch Ness murder, but we don't want to give away what happened there. Um, yeah. Uh, We could do a play on Doug Henning, um, uh, Magic Doctor, Flashy, um, Vortex. Uh, Red Vortex. Red Blob in the Sky. Red Rocket. Red Rocket. Um, uh, graffiti. Uh, NASA, NASA vandalism. Um, orange pants. That was my response. People said, well, "What you know? What color do you see with the dress?" Like, oh, orange pants. Uh, there is a color theme here. Because we have the, the guy with the gold lame, we talked about the blue and black dress, the gold white dress, the red thing in the sky, the black flesh. Oh, black flesh. I like Up that. your nose, Banksy. <laughs> yeah. Um, flesh. Monster meat. There we go. That works. Hey, Bonnie had a weird question that she thought you might know the answer to. Uh, they were going through. Uh, oh, by the way, Justin. Uh, if you could send me, like, you right now lack the ability to interrupt anyone. Can you f up your level to us, and then I could turn you down here? Yep. Check, check, check. One, two, three. Keep going. Here, uh, Andrew, talk and... Hi, I'm Andrew Main. And then interrupt. Yeah. All right, talk. this is... Yeah, that's much better. Okay. Um, so they were going through Bonnie's dad's stuff cause they, they just moved and, uh, they, they found like an old world war II med kit and there, there was something in the thirties and forties. They used to have it in girl scout, uh, survival kits or whatever. This is all according to Bonnie and I don't know where she heard it from, but there was something that, uh, that either upon exposure to air would ignite or she unfortunately didn't have yeah, any details. Uh, yeah. There's a, uh. You could use it in lanterns and lamps and stuff like that. Um, uh, I used to have a lanterns like that. Yeah, you have a. Do you know what it is or how we would look that up or? It, it'll come to me in a moment. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm sure somebody here in, will know. But yeah, I mean that that's an actual thing. Like you could use it. But there was something that uh, that either upon exposure to air would ignite, or she unfortunately didn't have yeah, any details. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a. Uh, you could use it in lanterns and lamps and stuff like that. Um, uh, I used to have a lanterns like that. Yeah, you have a. Do you know what it is or how we would look that up or? It, it'll come to me in a moment. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm sure somebody here in, will know. But yeah, I mean that that's an actual thing. Like you could use it. it wow. Yeah. Oh. Ready to do after things? Yeah, I'm ready yep. to go. All right. Uh, you ready to begin? Yeah, Nesh, we're starting at 66.55 or so. Ready? Ready. Is this the... Uh is this the end credits music? This 
series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Oh, this is in search that, of boys and girls. That was probably my first introduction to the man we know as Leonard Nimoy. Wow, oh. man! As a kid, I didn't have as much patience for Star Trek, the older version, initially. But goddamn, in search of, oh yeah, I was up in that. Uh, looking back on it, are you a little bit weirded out with how fast and loose they played with with facts? Oh, I knew. I mean, as a kid, I knew they're like I, I knew that. But but is you know, and becoming a young skeptic, like absolutely, it was it was it was Von Daniken, you know, chariots of the gods. It was BS. It was that. But it was so much fun. Yeah. Oh, definitely, man. I remember. I remember the entire family wanting to watch some Nadio Nadia Comaneci biopic, and I went to like the crappy television, the little black and white in the corner in the in the other spare bedroom to watch it in search of by myself about all that stuff because I was it was it was electrifying, man. Yeah. So those of you who don't know, in search of was a show hosted by Leonard Moy, and it was this. I think it was syndicated, and it would talk about all sorts of weird stuff, ancient aliens. You know, where did Amelia Earhart go? It was always these weird, fantastical things. It's like, imagine weird things if we weren't skeptics, you know, uh, if we just believed everything. But it yeah, was fun. Dude. It was a fun show. And and as some skeptics are like, yeah, I mean, you, you can certainly criticize it for not trying to find the truth. But if you sort of know how the world works, you're like, man, it's like Bigfoot photos, all that stuff. That was great. But the reason I wanted to start off with that was, you know, this week, just a few days ago, Leonard Nimoy passed away, and sadly he is gone. But what an amazing life he's had! What an amazing life he's had playing an iconic character, the most one of the most iconic characters you can ever imagine. Spock, who you know is as an important a figure as you know Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker. Oh, easily. And then do other things. Uh, yeah. Also, for the record. Uh, he lived a long time and made a lot of money. That dude lived long and prospered. Take took his advice. That one did. You can go to if you go to if you're in L.A. and you go to the Griffith Park Observatory, the Griffith Observatory. There is there's an observatory proper, and below it there's a humongous basement, and there is a theater, a brand new theater, state of the art theater, and it was started with a million dollar donation from Leonard and his wife to make that possible. And it's a story of the observatory told by him. So I, I am thrilled with the fact that he may have left, but every day, school kids, grown-ups, elderly, whatever, people from around the world can go sit in a theater and listen to him tell you the story in his absolute enthusiasm for Grit of Observatory. This is a guy that played an iconic role, also was an amazing director, but he lived a very big life. He did a lot of different things. He's left so many things for us to enjoy. And I wanted to start by sharing one of the things that he did that I really loved. Uh, dude, absolutely, a hundred percent. Do we know what he passed away from? I mean, I, I mean, I, at the age of eighty-three, I assume it's long. Um, I think it was. Uh, let me look this like, up. Like, I guess what I guess the, the only thing that's significant is is whether or not it was it was a you know an overnight thing or something that everyone. I think saw he coming. knew it was coming. Um, is is helping. COPD is what they're saying. I don't know what that is. Cardio so, something. Would you say that you know number one? Leonard Nimoy was somebody that came. Can you not hear me? Uh, yeah, it's just it sounds like you're underwater, uh, or, or like it's. Uh, he, he died of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a condition he attributed to a smoking habit he had given up approximately thirty years prior. Got it. There you go. Uh, sorry, Justin's fixing his audio. We're not hearing anything just yet. Uh, but he's a guy that, that that's you look at there is the role that he played, which obviously is important and it's iconic and it made possible because of the guy that, that, that he you know how he played him. And then there's the role he played in life, which I think is such an interesting thing to talk about. And you know, it's one of these people that you hear, you know, people have uh, you know very nice things to say. You know, that, that Walter Koenig revealed that Nimoy personally had, had advocated for equal pay for both, you know, Koenig and Nichelle Nichols on Star Trek. And that, you know, he was a person that looked out for other people and that he's, you know, was able to, 
get along with, you know, Shatner in his period when he was maybe not as able to get along with anybody else. He's a guy that just has done so many different things and, you know, has tried to help a lot of different people. Um, you know, I, I wish uh, I, I never read um, I Am Not Spock and I Am Spock, but I thought I always found it fascinating that after having his public presence defined by the character Spock, that he would, he would uh, kind of lash out against it and then uh, and then to come back around to it. Um, I, I know my <laughs> the only thing I know about I Am Spock is that my brother said that there's a passage in there in which he absolutely insists, hand to God, that that's Ricardo Montalban's chest and not a rubber fake uh, amazing chest in Wrath of Khan. I believe it's his chest. <laughs> I, I oh yeah sure I believe it. It uh, does look uh, fake and rubber as hell though. What's yeah. that? Hey, all right. Uh, but all right. So so that and I haven't read those books either. But yeah. what it seems to indicate to me, as an outside observer, is that the way that we look at those role, at his role, Spock's role, you know, at Star Trek in general, has changed so dramatically in his lifetime that it is not, when he writes, I am Spock, it seems as if he is saying, I am so much more than a guy who played a character, right? And, and that he has these interests and, and, and he, is, it, he is joyful of Spock. You know, he obviously is somebody that, you know, he's not, he, he never really had the same, anger at, at, as William Shatner seemed to exhibit of like, no, I am an actor. I just played this thing. And then later kind of, uh, they both sort of found peace within it. Leonard Nimoy seems like he is the blueprint for which we look at and almost expect as a nerd genre community of the people that play roles now, you know, like it's not enough that Nathan Fillion plays Captain Mal Reynolds. If he retweets something that you know, a, a prominent science figure or Neil deGrasse Tyson says everybody flips out because we want them to be these people. They, we want them to be people like us. Leonard Nimoy was people like us before we were ready to admit that we were people like us. And this is the stuff that we wanted to talk about uh, on a large mainstream level like it is now. Uh, when you say this stuff, you're talking about uh, his contributions in the in search of type of things so, or, I mean, or just it, geek culture? It, in living within this genre, you know, or living within like this frame of reference in science, in 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 the Griffith absor Observatory stuff. If this happened now, let's move all of this up to now and say that 10 years ago, Leonard Nimoy starred in a huge genre defying sci-fi series. And then he put $10 million toward, you know, this big expansion of, of the Griffith Observatory. It would be legend making amongst, you know, our Twitter, Facebook sphere today. Right. Like these are the kind of things that if, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, Edward James almost from, you know, from who, who gained fame in Battlestar Galactica, amongst many other things, or Blade Runner. If he did something like that, we would be like, oh, my God, what a cool and more awesome person he is because uh, he, he echoes these interests that we have. Do uh, was that a big public thing or or how uh, when he donated a million dollars to the Griffith Observatory? Maybe? I didn't know until I sat. I went to the observatory and I saw that they had a theater named after him, and then I read the story on it and found out that I mean he you know and he's in it talking about it. I didn't realize his involvement for it, and and uh, not having read either of the books, but from my understanding, the you know the first book uh, I'm not Spock came out like 1975. You know it's less than a decade since Star Trek. You know had just been off the air but was still in circulation he's still so close to it and it's like oh yeah this thing and it's hard to know you're you're in the middle of this he came back 1995 you know 20 years later and writes i am spock because something thing something happened star trek became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger it wasn't just a thing that nerds talked about in 1975 the character spock he first wanted to say listen this is spock i'm not this guy i'm a guy who played this guy and not a thing like i don't like this guy or whatever but it's like this is them he did, he, when he wrote I Am Spock, it was, to, hey, you know what? Spock was a character that I was, you know, I was supposed to cast to play. And it was the ideas of a lot of people what he should be. In the almost 30 years since then, a lot of who Spock was has now become part of me. And that's what I think is really interesting, the idea that, yeah, I played that role, but there's so many qualities about that role that, that you know, I have now incorporated into myself and that, you know, that he... You know, he says, no, I guess I am Spock to a degree. Spock and I are sort of similar. And then you look at when he played Spock again 
in like the uh, unification episodes of Generation, and you look at you know where he was able to go with the J.J. Abrams movies, and you see where the humanizing element of Spock and what he did with Spock in uh, I love the, the Undiscovered Country, by the way, which he directed. Um, or he didn't direct. No, he did a Voyage Home. But I love the the Voyage Home. You look at what's, what what literally way when he directed that film, that Star Trek film, and what he made Spock be, and kind of the reinvention of that and the human side of it. It was a lovely, lovely merging of those personalities. You talk about later on, and I am Spock. But I just want to get at like you can live a very, very full life that's beyond just the thing. And some of the most interesting things that he did were the things he did as a human being. I mean, it gave me great joy just to sit down in this theater and watch him talk about. His love of, you know, this is a guy that didn't search of that wacky, weird stuff, but now his real legacy is in this wonderful place of science, encouraging people to have an appreciation for it and enjoyment of it. Well, also, at the point that he writes, I am not Spock, I would take a guess that his daily existence as an actor in Los Angeles, the, you know, blowing up as a genre actor on a show that, you know, was looked at as, you know, popular among the nerds is more of an albatross than like now where I think, you know, like you said, it got bigger and bigger. Now it's something that like presidential candidates will say as like affirming cred that they are like hip with a, a, a very current pulsing element of our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a whole new thing that like when as soon as you added in this 30 years, 40 years of longevity that these characters are not just this thing that, you know, a subsection of people enjoyed, but rather enduring elements of American folklore, uh, well, that, that and, changes the game. And, and part of it, too, is what's helped is that as genre, sci-fi fantasy genre has become one of the biggest, you look at all the tentpole films now and you look at that, as that has become the biggest driving force, when you do those sort of sci-fi or fantasy or superhero kind of stuff, you're not on the margins anymore, you're right in the mainstream. And so... Oh, yeah, you're the guy that played this. Well, guess what? People who watch this also watch this other stuff. You look at the casting on the CW shows now and how they're, you know, they're going to do like a Supergirl series and they're bringing in people who, you know, known for genre roles and say, well, let's hire them because there's an automatic build in with, you know, the, the, the fans when they see people like that. And so I think that's the upside is that it's not just the cheap, you know, now that it's become high, you know, the, the sort of the high margin product we create. Do, do you think we're seeing uh, nerds become the new jocks? Like, is this a case where, where mainstream is not only being contributed to by, you know, geeky, you know, uh, internet subculture genre stuff, but maybe, you know, shaped by and dominated by? And, and, and if so, what, what becomes the fringe in this world? I, you know, we have to have, what is it, how do we define the nerd? I mean, the, the nerds are the, the disenfranchised, right? I guess by definition, they're the dif disenfranchised. And now, you know, everyone loves to call themselves nerds and geeks. Uh, they're, they're very powerful. And now they're in this holier than thou, you know, the whole, you know, fake gamer girl thing. And it's like, you know, no, you're not liking it the right way. We, we're, we're seeing some jock-like bullying from the, the nerd crowds because they finally have a little bit of power. I think that's, that's, that's hard to say because I think we're... You, you you immediately get into self selecting of like what is a jock you know like is a jock somebody who likes sports is it somebody who bullies you know and and what separates somebody who just quietly the fat kid who quietly played defensive end and, you, and all the same like the programmer of that whole thing yeah no, I mean like I haven't seen that it's I think you no know, that's a whole thing the programmer that's like that's a new thing it's the San Francisco the, I am I am well aware of the programmer uh, uh, sub like, for Brian it's you know. It's explaining to Brian here, you know what that is. Like it's like a real type in programmer. It's 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 the it's the jock who programs. Uh, well, so, and like and and you see that's a huge element of of Silicon Valley. You know, Silicon Valley is is like looking at at this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, within even like what is supposed to be this kind of nerd nirvana of you know the 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 geeks won and created their own companies, and yet now here are these other people that. They might not be wearing Abercrombie and Fitch, right? But they are still uh, – they are within this culture and they're there for, for – I don't know. And I, I guess and I, the label I, stuff I think kind of uh, – kind of I'm, I'm, I'm not in, interested in labels uh, so much as the shifting. Um, but I'll, if but I'll tell you where that label came from though. This is why this exists. 
It used to be when you were a geek or a nerd and you were doing your thing, you were doing your thing alone. You were by yourself in the middle of nowhere because nobody else around you did that thing like you and you did not have the social skills. You did not have a hierarchy. You were a guy there, then maybe you existed in some sort of online forum or something like that. But as nerds, as this technology, as this has become the driving force of the economy and the way the world works and we collaborate and you work and you put a bunch of them in a room together, you're going to get – Okay, well, we're not always going to be so socially inept anymore. We're going to be, you know, we're going to learn to cooperate or get along or do this. And you're also going to get the different kinds of, it's going to be the lunchroom cafeteria. You know, they're going to get the bros over here. You're going to get the different groups and personalities. And that's what's happened as, as nerds have been able to gather together and other people identify with it. You start to see this emergence of things like the programmer of like, yeah, program. But like, man, we're going rock climbing this weekend. You know, we're going to go to the gym and all this and, you know. Yeah, I, I guess what I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm not so much interested in categories and, and social cliques so much as, um, you know, the type of – there was something if you were um, – if you felt powerless that was empowering to watch uh, uh, Star Trek, you know, and and, um, and that attracted you to characters like Peter Parker and, and to the Marvel comic book universe. Uh, and it was because – you felt like you were not in the mainstream that made these mm -hmm. things so attractive. But now we live in a world where, uh, I mean, is the Avengers the highest grossing movie of all time or somewhere close to it, right? Um, like those same things, sure. yeah. okay, those same things are the mainstream. They are what everybody, like if you don't like the Avengers, then you're the disenfranchised. You're the weirdo who doesn't like what everyone else likes. That's, that's what's fascinating to me. Uh, like by the numbers... Um, you know, what was uh, the, the, the fringe loner, uh, the, the type of material that appealed to them is now what appeals to the mainstream. So I wonder who the new folks on the fringe are that will be defining, you know, uh, culture 20 years from now. I, I guess. But here's here's the one thing I would say about that is that we have experienced such a splintering of all cultures that it's not necessarily that we have that the, that the genre culture has necessarily i mean it's certainly grown like physically but it has grown greatly in influence because it was hardened kind of before culture in general split before it was you know there was just a few main troughs that everybody got information and therefore gatekeepers could say nah this is just a little thing you know we don't want this kind of entertainment on here we got to appeal to the masses uh as we've seen culture split i feel like genre culture has become more influential because there was always definitions to it. And now in a world where there are so many different messages, we can all latch on to these properties that many of which have been around 30, 40 years. People have these long relationships with, and, uh, you know, they are, th that signal is just more clear because there have been these communities that were formed, uh, from distress, many of them, because I think, I think when we talk about too, like the, there, there's the technical side and the cultural side. When we talk about a lot of the the cultural side of, uh, you know, what nerd stuff, all that, it was things that it was that was considered childish years ago for an adult to be into. It was if you know, like we all, yeah, Star Wars was huge when I was a kid. If you were a kid, now it's big. So I think if you want to say. What do kids really like that adults go, no, that's childish. Yes, that's yes, silly. that you nailed it. That was what I was, that's what I was seeking to discover. And all, and the moment you put it in those terms, it's so clear to me that it's, it's the Minecrafts. It's the, uh, you know, it's the, you know, I mean, I guess you're kind of seeing like Lego movies right now is, 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 you know, did you hear what they're doing kids. with Star Wars? Uh, no, wait, are they going to do a Lego movie Star Wars? Dude, they're doing all six films as Lego versions that they're going to be airing leading up to the new movie coming out. Oh, wow. This, that, so this is all on television then, right? Yeah, I assume so, yeah. But yeah. they're going to do Lego versions of this. And it's fascinating. So it was it was maybe, I think it was, was like Chris Anderson in his book Free talked about his kids like to watch. They preferred to watch other kids making their versions of Star Wars using Legos. And he's like, hey, this is an opportunity they should look into. And next thing you know... They do the, you know, because they do the Lego Yoda Chronicles, all this, and now they're going to do that. But I mean, that's, it's fascinating. Like, yeah, I look at, I look at this, this, the thing I'll say that's different now, though, is that we are part of, part of being, I think, a, a good nerd is saying, hey, that's not my thing, but I like the fact that you have that. You know, that's really cool that you like that. You know, I'm not going to laugh at you that you do this other thing. That's cool. And that's what's changed. So it's going to be harder to have those really, really fringy things unless they're just 
totally socially unacceptable because it's like, oh yeah, that's weird. But we, the idea is accepting is the idea of accept. Let's, let's throw, let's have a dragon con and have a parade and you're going to see a ton of stuff you're not into, but be like, cool, you know? And that's, that's like, I used to, you know, like guys who collect like old classic cars, it's beyond me. It's beyond me. I, I, I drive by Bob's big boy every Friday night. There's a big classic car collection there. These guys just Guys and women you know, have these cars there. I love that. And I've gone there and looked at it. I, no part of me wants to take a 1955 car and restore it and go show it off. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Right. But I love that people have that. Uh, yeah, I guess the only exception to, to that universally is certainly, and I think it's less now, but there was like a genuine recoiling of horror among the, even the geek community uh, at the, the idea of grown men watching My Little Pony. Which, um, which again, you talk about like, well, that's supposed to be for kids. What are you doing liking stuff that's for kids? Weirdos? Girls. You know, yeah. And for girls, which to me only made it all the more punk rock. You know, it's like, what's, uh, what's more punk than saying, I genuinely don't care what you think. I'm going to do what you think is the most inappropriate, horrific, dumb thing for me to do. You know, and, and you know, 30 years ago was dyeing your hair, you know, giant colors and shaving parts of it and and, and uh, spiking it all out or whatever. Nowadays, it's dressing up as Rainbow Dash. Or nowadays, you're also seeing a giant movement towards not just um, uh, uh uh, cosplaying, but uh, but cross playing, where it's like everyone swaps gender and does different versions of it. It's it's like this. These are the fringier elements. Like as I'm as I'm working this out of my mind, that I think are only going to be more and more mainstream in the next uh, 10, 20 years. Well, let me let me let me pitch this thing about the Bernie culture to you. What if it's not necessarily defined by the fact that they had the bravery to do it? Because I think part of the Bernie culture was that let's assume that the rest of the world doesn't understand. The, the strength of this is that our community is something that matters, is that, you know, but the, there's the reason the whole friendship is magic element was like, no, 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 we connect with each other and it doesn't matter what the outside says. We have us. What if the definition of what's different in 2015 or 14, 13, is that they were kind of assimilated into geek mainstream geek culture far faster than they may ever have been previously where i think that they still get static but like i don't think in in general you would see a lot of people spitting on the ground when somebody talks about bronies now compared to like the first one or two years when people uh when, when they first kind of came around i think that's what's really amazing about it that they weren't it wasn't like what furries furries kind of never really hit that line now obviously there's a bit of a sexual dynamic to the furries that kind of uh, you know, makes it a little bit more complicated than than the bronies. But uh, they there was there they kind of got stuck in this in this limbo of like no 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 you're y yeah you're in the geek community but you're kind of at, at the side here. <laughs> we've we've got this adjacent lot for you. Bronies, I feel like you know they, they're they're more mainstream than I would have guessed that they would have been when I grew up. I thought that they would be closer to furries than let's say trekkies. Uh, yeah, and I think part of it, of course, is, you know, that's a unique property and that they hired some smart writers that figured out very early on that they should be writing for adults who are watching, you know, uh, and but also, uh, yeah, it, but but uh, yes, I definitely do find it remarkable that that in such a short time, the assimilation happened. I, and I'll and I'll be like, I know, like, I'm in the like, the old guard here when I saw this. I'm like, oh, it's like a bunch of gay guys are like my little pony. All right. And then it's like, but it's not. It's, yeah, it's it's it. That's a thing that I'm like. Like it's it's not it's not like there's like a big like there's like a big space 1999 like cult fan community, and it's actually like it's like a gay thing for some reason. Interesting, right? but like with the Brony thing, it's like oh, heterosexual guys log it, and it's like prob overwhelmingly. And to me, it's like I, I I don't get it, but that's awesome. That's awesome that these you know they like this. That they get excited over it's for girls. And no, it's. Which, and a know. lot of it is that like they can connect with somebody and and it's a lot of the experience that you know i think for for people who kind of were coming of age as the internet continued to dawn you know everybody has had and, and i guess this will just be a a normal rite of passage from now until forever when you just found that rich vein of people who connected on the level that you wanted to connect on over the internet you know, you know that's I'll that's a that's a wonderful thing we talked about in my pick earlier on weird things, which is makers uh, or uh, by Chris Anderson, and it's the ability now to find the people who like the things that you like, whether it's 
right now, the number one movie in the box office is Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. Okay? This movie existed because there was a Twilight fan fiction community. And, you know, that's where the story started. It was Twilight fanfic. It was characters in Twilight. And people were like, nope, you have something more interesting here than the vampire stuff. Get rid of that. And it became this phenomenon. And, and that was because of the ability to get feedback. What you have right now is a resource. What you have right now is a resource out there. Eventually, people are going to learn to make it so mass capitalize it and divide it up and diminish the value of it at some point. But right now, there's an um, it'll still have value, but there's an immense amount of potential right now waiting to happen if you start a community. And it doesn't have to be a lot of people. Just a handful of people are actively into something to solve a problem, to promote, or talk about something. Don't look at it as like, hey, how do I make money off this? You look, about, look at it as how do I celebrate this? Chris Anderson created his robot drone company, which now, yeah, it's a big company, but he created that because he says, I would love to be able to make this device. I would love to be able to make this device. I will share everything I learned with everybody else what they've learned. Stephanie Myers, people who contribute or people who create other stuff, you know, people who like start out there as fans of one thing and then start creating things like that. There's communities out there. If you want to write, there's Wattpad. You can go write your little novels, your little stories, your character stuff. And there are other people out there. There's so many different communities and so many abilities to create stuff out there. It's a great place to start. And I think it's amazing. I don't know how long it'll last. That was uh that was one of my favorite parts of Bold where he talked about community building and the ability to find something that resonates with enough people that everybody chips in and and mm -hmm. wants to crowdsource uh you know the development of it and that you know that's that's how stuff like you know the my little pony conventions came to be is you know nobody said I bet I can make a lot of money manipulating these guys that you know they built the community and then the rest you know came out of that Have you followed the uh, the latest on the Hyperloop project No what is the latest so uh, a while back, Elon Musk talked about, you know, he had this idea for a rapid form of transportation and that would be uh, basically could revolutionize transportation. And the problem was, is that, you know, Elon Musk, his investors and all that were nervous because, listen, you, you got a rocket company, you've got a solar panel company, you've got a car company. Maybe you should just focus on is like, all right, I'll tell the world what my plan is. And I'll let you guys figure out what to do. Well, what's happened is he's, you know, Elon Musk has ignited the imaginations of lots and lots of people. And he proposed this. People were quick to point out, you know, why this was not going to work or why it was problematic. But that was fine. Some other people got very excited. And there's a company called Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. And Elon Musk says anybody wants to use it, they can use it. They started off with a group of, they said, hey, we're engineers and other people involved in this. We'd like to make this thing happen. So they've created a company. They started developing their own plans for it. And they have a plan to try to actually build a test track. And, you know, they're going to do, you know, they're trying to, the way they're going to go about funding is I think they're talking about maybe doing an IPO or whatever like that. So I don't, you know. We'll see how well that succeeds, but the point is, is this is one of the most ambitious technological problems of all time, is very likely going to get some kind of funding to some extent, and you're going to have a room of people sitting at desk working to solve this problem who started collaboratively across the internet. Uh, I think all of that is rad and great, and I love the story of it. Also, it will never happen. There will never be a... Why do you say that? Um, because, uh, because we don't need to get those distances that much faster than we do it right now. What we need is more productive capabilities while we're in transit from point A to point B. And uh, I mean, there are, there are situations um, that there's the high end and the low end, the low end, um, you know, going 600 miles or uh, thereabouts is, 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 is good enough for most people if they can have, you know, uh, awesome Wi-Fi while, while, while they're doing it and they could get a lot done on, on their plane flight. On the high end, there are some people, the, the, the kind of people who booked the Concord, who, who will need to go very, very fast from point A to point B, but they will be able to buy rockets to get them there in a, in a very fast way. I, 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 I was, my mindset on Hyperloop was, eh, we'll see, and then somebody made it, made it, I heard one comment and I go, oh, yeah, this is going to happen. And I'll tell you, one is like, I think that everybody wants to travel faster. Everybody wants to be able to travel faster. If it's, a, if it's cheap and it makes money, if it's cheap enough to do it, absolutely. You know, I, I go to San Francisco, I go to Portland. I would much rather get there in an hour than get there in three hours or four hours with good Wi-Fi. I don't want to spend that much time traveling. I better I, 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 if that is true, then explain to me the, the push for self-driving cars. I would rather take These a self-driving car. These are all solutions. On, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, they're, 
Yes. Why? Why is there only one answer in your future? Why is there only one answer to this? I'm not, I'm not saying that. What I'm what I'm saying uh, is, is the, the, the self. I, to, I apologize. The, the self driving car, like let's say, uh, for example, if there's two versions, you can drive yourself and you can go 70 miles an hour, or you can have the car drive and it goes 50 miles an hour. I would take the car drive and, and go in 50 in a heartbeat. Oh yeah, no, no. So no then I, I'm and I, I think we're going. Stuff. Yes, the answer to all these things. Yes, I will tell you why I think we may see something like the Hyperloop. We're not. I'm not saying it's going to be between L.A. and San Francisco. Why not Dubai? Why not the China? You know, they're building high-speed trains. They're spending billions of dollars in these projects. I guarantee you, we will probably see something like it. Not here at first. It won't happen here at first. Dubai, China, place like that. Absolutely think that you're going to see something very soon in the next ten years. You're going to see a fast, fast, fast project like that. Let me ask you this, Brian. So whether or not, because I think part of if you're going to make a bet on whether or not this is going to happen you have to bet that a government a state government is going to get behind it as a solution right because especially the hyperloop is based on the idea that you are building it next to i5 and stuff like that and that's the way that you solve the 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 price problem of trying to build railroad tracks and having you know farmer john say like oh no it's a billion dollars for my land now uh, cuz i know you're building a big thing so do you think that post a successful and hypothetical world where we have a proof of concept that works and functions and let's say we got two or three of them in, in Dubai or China or something like that, that in the way that we've seen bullet trains become popular on state ballots, that we would see something like this become uh, – popular on state ballots. Yeah, I mean, once once we go into the realm of hypothetical and and we can envision a world where it doesn't cost anything more than current bullet train pl- programs or whatever, then yes. But 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 certainly in the climate in the United States right now, I would say that on the menu of faster ways to travel, uh, that one has, I believe, the steepest price tag out of all of them because it's not just like you, you want to build a rocket to fly to uh, fly around, build, build one rocket, get in the one rocket, fly off. You build a hyperloop, you need massive cooperation. You got to build a, a thing that is maintained that it's goes. Cheap, well, I mean, it, it's theoretically on paper, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than the bullet train, the, the high speed rail they're trying to build right now here in California. Uh, well, I, I think that's a bad idea too. <laughs> it's, well, it's a horrible it's, idea. Yeah. But guess what? They've already started building that. Uh, yeah, I don't think that'll get finished either. I don't think that's. Gonna I, I agree, but they're again. They they're already they're already spending money on that. Yeah, they're already no, I, spending I, money. I, I, okay, let me let me let me revise my my prediction. It absolutely will get started. It absolutely will not get finished in my lifetime. I, I will say that. The high the California high speed rail. Uh, or no, no, no. A a, 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 a a hyperloop that is well. I mean, but again, you could define like a short like you know hundred mile trip. You know, well, I'm well, saying take there. China, take China, where they have parts of China where. Robot cars, nice. There's not enough space even to park those robot cars, and they've got to get millions of people in and out of cities really fast. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For China, like I could see China building a 300 mile, 400 mile, 800 mile an hour high speed corridor or whatever. I could see, you know, Dubai. It, I could see them doing this. Yeah, I, I guess I, I could. Uh, but again, yeah, I'm thinking mainly of the United States. But uh, but you're right. You know, overseas where, you know, where you got government spending their money and and uh, you know. Uh, Solving one specific price a problem, price be damned, then I can absolutely see that. Well, and also let's if if we are going to move because to me, the idea of any kind of I go from one city to another technology has always kind of fallen apart based on, you know, if I'm going from San Francisco to LA, everyone drives in LA. You know, it, it's very hard. It's driving it, it, right now. Yet uh, from one point to another without a car. However, in a post Uber Lyft situation, and you, you have to assume that that's where self-driving cars, uh, become, you know, bigger and better. Uh, that seems more reasonable. I mean, like it just seems like, all right, I get to the Hyperloop. I, you know, I can drive to the Hyperloop station. I can take the Hyperloop down. And now I'm not immobile once I get to, the other is, the, is that part uh, of the hyperloop is that you would load in your car and it'd be like a ferry that would no, drive your no, car no, down no. or well some of there was a, a a mock-up in his original white paper on how that would be possible but i don't think that's what anybody is is trying to build right now yeah uh i i just i just you know i i feel like on on like that one's off the dollar menu uh it, it's one of the more expensive items i feel like there there are other items that that will get picked up first but but, but again, uh, foreign governments, I agree, will probably jump on this. Uh, I mean, I think it all 
I mean, it, it, really, I don't know. I mean, like, like, like Brian, I think you make a very good point that, you know, at, at the point where you argue for it, we're already past like three or four hypotheticals. And, and if this were, you know, uh, Professor McDingleberry, uh, who, who gave this white paper and not Elon Musk, who has, you know, the Elon Musk halo around him, I think we would probably look at the Hyperloop differently than, than the way that we look at it now. Uh, but all that being said... I think the promise of a functioning, super fast, one point to another uh, mass transportation system, I don't think is necessarily cursed. I think that we want it in theory. It's just that every way that we do it now, uh, like it like it has been kind of dumb. And also in a cab only situation, it's just impractical like even they built i think they did build one from orlando to tampa which is like an hour drive and it's just the dumbest idea ever especially since you're going from like one commuter city to another commuter city where it's really dumb to get around you know and anything and like maybe with an uber it makes a little bit more sense but even then why not just drive the hour as opposed to the you know like what do you, what do you really gain in saving those 40 minutes well, and that's the other thing, too, is, is think about, um, uh, and maybe this is colored by the fact that I have a family, but it's like, you know, any form of public transportation is, is far, far less attractive when you're lugging crap for a vacation or a trip and taking kids with you. It's, it's miserable. Like right now, uh, the minivan is a space station. They've got entertainment in. We've got, we got the milk where it needs to be. We, got, uh, we know where the diaper bag is. We know we are set in that little spaceship. We could go anywhere, and it's just a matter of how much time it takes from get a, point A to point B. Uh, the idea of, of taking our spaceship, ripping out all the parts that we're going to need for a vacation, hopping on a Hyperloop to save ourselves you know, uh, you know, uh, an hour or two hours more than a flight – uh, you know, uh, uh, it. I mean, it's it's gonna depend. I mean, the, the the you know the theory is the idea that you can you can sh- put a lot a lot, lot more people through there than you can through a flight quarter. And you know, when I travel, like you know, when I travel different you know different legs, sometimes it's it's all business travelers. It's all business travelers. And when you can open up a quarter, if you if you could in theory open up a high hyperloop corridor between Los Angeles and San Francisco with a couple stations in between. It would do amazing things, like a real, not the stupid bullet train they're trying. It would do amazing things for the economy because it becomes really practical to work and live in either city. You know, it, when it would, in, in theory, you know. How, just how, how short, okay, so right now when you fly, it's what, a little more than an hour from, uh, from San Francisco to L.A.? Yeah, about an hour and change. Okay, yeah. so let's say there's two stops along the way. This is the other thing too, right? Is is there's no flybys? There's no. Well, I guess there could be theoretically, but um, uh, like, what are you going to save? Literally thirty minutes. Uh, well, but even then, you'll have to stop for the stations. Um, no, I mean that there's 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 a there is a cost. There's a huge cost associated with that. There's the theory that you would if you were able to run these like you did trains, then it's a hell of a lot easier to catch. You catch one of these like you do a train, and not like trying to. You go, you show up, you, and like you don't book. Don't a, have, yeah, you don't book a premium fare, or whatever. You just, you just you have just, your your wristband, and you walk in whenever you want. Yeah, yeah and all right, no, that makes that. sense. And, you know, obviously, and you know, and like I know it's like usually when I travel, like security screenings is super fast because like I go non peak hours and stuff like that, and like last three or four times I've gone to the airport, there have been three people in front of me. And so you could think in an efficient system where they're different, run differently, perhaps they're not the TSA, whatever. And like if you get on trains, you don't go through any of that. Um, but anyhow, point is like, yeah, it's like the idea is if you just show up and you hop on. And that's why like air taxis and things like that are interesting models is that if you can just like, oh, yeah, just show up at airport, I'll catch a flight. You know, I'll, I know that I'll get one. I know that I'll get on there. Um, it changes the dynamic. and I, But I think there's a lot of answers. Like I'm like you, like, I'm excited about like a robot car that can go 200 miles an hour in a corridor on the highway because that'll change. Like, yeah, let's hop into a car, sit back, kick back, and relax. But those, there are some technical problems that are still really, 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 really hard. Blizzards, well, and, construction. And, and, I, and again, like, like this is all stuff. Like, I do believe a lot of good will come from trying to make this work, and and certainly a lot of problems will get solved that'll benefit you know all forms of of travel out there. But uh, yeah. Well, the core reason we brought this up, though, was to talk about how your your point of view, certainly not unreasonable. 
to say yeah. like, hey, this crazy idea that somebody is just building a test track for and probably would get, wouldn't get near the attention if it weren't for the fact that Elon Musk uh, is the one who said it will will never happen. I feel like that's that is that is a safe the field bet. Right. Like right. Uh, that that there are, are other more practical things that will happen. Uh, yeah. Before this, the, you know? the, the whole whole point was just to talk about the idea of crowdsourcing. When you bring a community and say that this was a project that was just pie in the sky, to now there's teams of engineers, and you know who knows how what their well, skill level is. And this or is not, the, but this to me is the biggest and most exciting thing about uh, uh, crowdsourcing is that it allows you to uh, to shoot for the moon in ways that that nobody agrees with. literally in the case Ex of the google moon project exactly all of a sudden it's like you know it's like hey it's great entire world that you don't believe us that's fine also uh we're just gonna go for it and uh have a good day you know it's like that's something you don't get to do when mm -hmm. you're when you're when you're trying to argue for it's like no oh, this is a public works program we need you know government money to blah 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 like all of that goes away when it's like well you could you guys could talk and argue we're gonna shut up and try it yeah, it's it's wonderful, and I think that one of the things too is that you don't have to be the lone inventor anymore. If you collaborate, you can get people on board, and and you you might meet somebody who's really good at mechanical engineering, you know, and it can help deliver your idea. You know, it's fun to look through Kickstarter to find some brilliant things, and then you see completely idiotic things that some guys like. I have an idea. I think I'm going to put it up there and see if I find any money. And they put, you know, they sat at Denny's one day, drew it down there, and like, this is how I become a billionaire. And that's and look at that. Don't be that guy. You know, be the person that w believes in the idea, not what the idea will get you. Believes in the idea, and will either find the skills to make it happen or find the people to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. They're out there. Any questions? Anything? Anybody <laughs> like, else want to? So yeah. Anyway, uh, oh, uh, well, if you'll sign up for our uh, secret insider program, where you can uh, get uh, five hyperloops for every buyer. Man, mm -hmm. I was, so I was at a bar in Chattanooga, and there's these two dudes talking, and he was like, "Oh my god, I'm going to this great." Uh, I think it was the rich dad, poor dad, one of the rich dad, poor dad. Uh, Guy Kawasaki, or not Guy Kawasaki? No, different. Yeah, like uh, things. Uh, Robert like, Kiyosaki. Oh. It was yeah. great. He taught me and, and he told everybody there uh, how and gave it the exact script, how you could get your uh, credit limit upped by like 30, you know, by 15, 20 thousand dollars. And, and they had oh. everybody walk out and like everybody came back in and they had twenty thousand dollars more of available credit because that's what you have to do when you're like buying property is you have available money and you're able to invest it. And I'm like. Like, oh, and then what happened? He's like, oh, you know, we left. And I'm like, well, no, you bet you probably asked you, pitched you on like the special thing, you know, the way that you really get the secret sauce. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, how much was that? Yeah, $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've got your credit limit increased. Well, it's like you already agreed that this is a program. You Look, you've seen how uh, spectacular the results are in only minutes. We were able to double your credit. Now that you have that leverage, are you going to not use it to secure yep. your future? Because if you don't believe that this works, why are you still here? You're here. You believe it works. You have the tools. Let's press that button, buddy. Let's get rich. Oh, man. So I'm going to tell you something that's interesting. Is that a, is that a uh, little too spot on? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, I... Me and, and Brett did a go game for a real estate seminar guru guy, and it's the only time. And we've, we, I've done go games for companies. I just did one for, for a company that I do not believe in their product. Uh, and uh, it is – Penicillin. Yeah. <laughs> it is hard when – like that's the only one that made me feel icky because like I see just – these wide-eyed people and like they remind me of people in my family that like have – Nothing but ambition and sometimes don't have quite the gumption to sit down and, and chart a, a better course. Two, two things. One, I, once I was at a Denny's and I sat down and I'm eating and I hear this guy give an Amway pitch to this young couple in back of me. You know, get, oh, yeah, you sign in, da, 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 da. He got up and he left. I turned around. I said, listen, guys, it's none of my business and I apologize yeah. But you know, you will never make any money in this, right? You understand that they're the only people who make money who started 30 years ago. You know that, right? His goal is to sell you. He is selling you. you know. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, we figured as much. But I just like, I had to say something. Yeah. I had another time, I was with a friend who, who was kind of a shady guy himself. I said, hey, I need you to come with me. I got to go talk to a guy about an investment thing. I'm like, 
like, all right. We go to an IHOP, another place where, you know, big transactions takes place. And this guy shows up and he's wearing like flip flops, shorts, you know, Florida casual. And what it was, as he says, was telling my friends this, yeah, says, you know, I, this is, this is way back when the, you know, the, before the bubble burst and the whole dot com thing, all that. He's like, listen, uh, yeah, I've got a, you know, what I'm doing is I'm looking for some partners. My son's a stockbroker at, at, you know, Goldman Sachs, whatever. And he gives me, he tells me when the big IPOs are coming in. And what I want is I want people to invest my money. But the problem is you have to spread it around because, like, your broker will only let you invest so many shares, whatever. So I'm looking for people to invest my money because I get tips because you call them up and you say, I want this. Like, ah, I can only give you so much. All right, whatever. Lays out this whole thing. And I'm like, I'm sitting there. I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This sounds totally like how Warren Buffett did. Totally how Warren Buffett did it, right? <laughs> and, then, and then I'm waiting for the pitch. And then he goes, I'm like, now, but, like, so I'll give you my money to invest. But to know that you're, you know, you're good, good that you're on the line – you know, you put in $3,000 up front and that way I know that you're serious about this, whatever, and I'll give you the tips because I'll call you up with the tips and tell you where to invest my money and all this, right? And and my friend sits there and says, listen, what do you think? And I'm sitting in front of the guy, right in front of the guy, and he feels like like a bit like, you know, uh, Tony Soprano's brother-in-law-ish kind of guy. You know, there's there's an edge to this guy. There's a New Jersey, New York kind of angle, wise angle there. But I said to him, I said, Right now, it is impossible for me to tell the difference between this and a scam. I said, he gives you his money, and then he waits for you to call back with these tips and then to tell you you're going to give him his money. You know, you're going to give him a bunch of money. This guy's response ignores me, just shuts me out and turns to my friend. It's like, well, you know, let me know what you think and da-da. Doesn't answer, doesn't respond, does not do anything, shut up. Guy leaves. We go out in the parking lot. My friend says, what do you think? I go, it's a scam. It's a scam. <laughs> do you remember the How part where I said, a- uh, where I said it sounds like a scam and then he didn't deny it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it's, a, you know, you, you give him $3,000 and then you, t- then you wait for him to call you up and say, Hey, here's my money to this. I said, and the, the, the whole bullshit about how like, Oh yeah, I can't, you know, I can only, they won't let me invest it all in this, that I need other people invested. And so he's meeting people in random strangers and I hop to tell you this. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but what if it's real? I'm like, what? You know, and I, my mind is blown here. And then I told my mom this, and my mom said something very interesting that stayed with me to this day. Because she knows the guy, the character. This guy's a guy who screwed over his own. The, the, my friend is a guy that has a bad reputation with his own friends and his own business and screwing people over. And this is the kind of scam he would run. My mom said, you can't cheat an honest man. Yeah. I'm like, you can steal from him, but you can't cheat an honest man. I'm like, that was. Very, very, very interesting. You know, that was uh, – so I walked away from thinking about that like, wow. And then right. I've had that – like I had a, a attorney friend of mine. He had a guy who was a successful, successful executive, got one of those, you know, Nigerian scammers. And the guy was like wanted to believe, just desperate to believe that this was real and like wanted to shut everybody else out, you know. And it's just – it's, there's it's, a uh, in the new in their latest book, uh, Think Like a Freak. There's a from the Freakonomics guys. They ask the question, why are those Nigerian 401 scam emails written so poorly? They're so transparently, obviously scams. And it turns out that there's an incentive because if you make them too good, you bring down too much heat. And if you but but by making them crudely written and uh, and well, it's also because of the spam bots filters. Uh, uh, yes, well, uh, 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 but, but, but like by making them crude enough, you pre-qualify the type of people who are the ones who will respond to you. Uh, when you make it dumb enough are the ones who you will be successful. You don't okay. want to access a, a more educated level of clientele. You want to make it uh, uh, as dumb. Uh, uh, all right, guys, I got to uh, I, I got to piece out here because uh, Crackle's leaving, and I yeah, got works get- for me. I got to I got to go shoot standups for Scam School. Man, good after things, gang. I, I've got to play with my. Whip. Uh, okay, can, can we real quick just say, can you announce what you're calling him? Oh, I don't know. I was joking. I was going to call it the Thwip, but I think Marvel no. probably trademarked that. Dude, I double check on that. He's got uh, his his uh, Wolverine claws. He's calling him Snicked, and the yeah. the the, the rub, uh, Spider-Man rubber band shooter. He's calling the Thwip. I love this, man. Yeah, I'll look up and see that. I, I'm giving away, so I'm not like charging for him. So I mean, just put the plans. We'll put up all that online. So, dude, I'm so yeah. excited. Um. I think this will be the first project. I think I think Penny is working towards us getting a 3D printer. So well, and my goal is this is what my goal is right now. If you go to Thingiverse and other places, it's kind of thin on really cool stuff. A lot of ornamental things and like ah, make this toy you can buy for a dollar. Um, 
I want to create cool stuff that you sit there and you go, oh man, I want to have, I want to shoot rubber bands or I want to, I want to poke my little sister's eye out with uh, <laughs> freaking yeah. claws. Uh, all right. Well, I, I know we got to go, so I guess I'll all be right, the guys, one to say it's it. Been after. It's been after. See you guys. Bye. Sweet. All right. Saving as. Boop, 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 boom. Weird things. Mm, 1503.01. Um, this was uh, Nessie Meat. Is that what we call it? Oh, well, first one was Monster Meat. Monster what? Meat, yeah, okay. Okay, so this will take just a second. So after things, let's want to call it like Hyper Loopy. <laughs> Hyper Loopy, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I feel I feel bad being the guy that uh, I I didn't mean it like I'll never work. I, I just meant like like placing my bet uh, oh, is I, you know I I was like it never happened here, but then somebody said what about Dubai or China, and then I'm like, oh yeah, like, and then I was like oh yeah that you know like Dubai like they'll spend billions of dollars on silly stuff, and then I'm like then all of a sudden I'm like okay there I see it, and then yeah. years and years years later if it's successful and people here are like well you know like you know bullet train projects get funded because there's so many opportunities for graft. So many opportunities for graft. Oh yeah, you know? so many, so many buyouts uh, or payoffs along the way to. Uh, uh, and yeah. not, and not, and, and and not even just like you know in a covert underground way, but just it's like if you're, do you want to have you know if we put this in your county, we're going to be spending a hundred billion dollars on construction. How do you say no to that? You yeah. know. Meanwhile, we'll be bankrupting your children's future and all that and, you know, putting us perilously close to economic collapse. But in the meantime, you get $100 million of, you know, construction in your county, you know. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting when we were talking about the FCC thing. And it's like if I'm, if I, if, if, if I'm going to, you know, be the asshole, you know, downplaying the wonderfulness and rainbows of net neutrality uh, regulations, then I better I, – I got some studying to do on my facts. But – um, when I was talking about like, look, bandwidth is becoming available and free and cheap and, and whatever. Uh, but Bryce, uh, I think really represented, uh, everyone else where he's like, yeah, but I just don't and won't trust Time Warner ever. No, and it's like, no. and it's like, and I think that's, that's the problem is that I think it's, it's, it's an emotional counter argument. It's, it's, well, and I, I no, And like, I, I agree. I, I, I wouldn't trust them either. And, and that's why you want to have alternatives. I, I don't trust, you know, well, that, I didn't that, trust that's my Elon. whole thing is, is like, yeah, I don't trust them, which is why I want to make it as easy as possible for, to get new people into the game. Yeah. And, and, and you know, what doesn't make it easy as possible to get new people in the game, uh, massive entrenched regulations that have a chilling effect. Yeah. On that the so. entrenched people who already have the most lobbyists and have the, will get it to make them the first thing they do once these things come in place is they then use that legislation. They use those positions to kill the competition. They, how do, how do we put this place? How do we put little things in there that make it even more difficult for that to happen? And that's yeah. the fear is that we want, we and, want and, the and, same and, thing, and, but historically, and, 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 and by the way, I, I don't want Bryce to think I'm trying to call him out or convince him or whatever. Like that's that's not uh, not what I what I intended. What I intended is just like you perfectly put. You made me realize what everybody's real thing is. Is that it's a deeply held rage against these these sh shit bags of companies. Un and understandable, understandable. And it, but it's like, you know, we have three 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 American automakers that I'm not in love with any one of them. You know, and, and you cannot you cannot be these companies. There's no level of incompetence that would allow these companies to go out of business. No level of incompetently run, poorly management, whatever. The government will always keep them in play. Will always keep them going because they have too many power lobbies, too much power, too much things. And well, this I don't want to see that happen to Time Warner and Comcast. I don't want to see that happen. Where well, yeah, we play by the rules. We keep these pricing tiers like this. Yeah, we had a few bad quarters, you know. But we're if we if we if we go out of business, then it's gonna the other companies are gonna have to raise the price. Blah blah blah. It becomes this nightmare. You can't even we can't even foresee, and that's been his well. And sport. I guess also here's the other thing, right? Is is right now we live in a world where there's so much rage. Uh, with rage comes momentum and the ability to make massive change. When the uh, Occupy Wall Street protesters uh, were there, they realized, oh man, uh, someone could switch off the internet and this is around the Arab springtime or whatever, like we can't rely on this. And so these people started to do stuff like, you know, a mesh network of individual uh, mini cell towers that, that, that you could just put one up. And as long as it with you, you were within earshot of someone else's, you could have it completely independent of any government completely encrypted. You could do all of this. 
FCC comes in and says, oh, I'm sorry, you want to be connected to the internet? You have to go through us. That shuts that down. That yeah. makes possible. In a world where, where, where Egypt was able to turn off the internet, I'm highly uncomfortable with We've us had our own codifying. government asking for an off switch. What's that? We've had our own government asking for an off switch. Yeah, these, it's it's yeah. I I uh, I'm, I I don't like it. I don't want it. I ain't get it. And uh, uh, it's What's like it? and, and all of a sudden, all of those efforts suddenly get squelched. They 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 they, they get squashed and they don't happen. And it's like, again. Yes, you will get the tangible benefits you guys seek. All of you. You will get the things that you ask for. You will never even know what might have been if you, well, if you hadn't done that. And look at you know the whole, the whole frustration people have with campaign finance reform. When McCain-Feingold, which was the original campaign finance thing, was planned, the goal was we got to get rid of the money in politics. And it was a naive idea. The, you know, well, money well-intentioned. Yeah, absolutely most well and two most sincere, well intentioned people can imagine trying to solve a problem that's as, as old as the Babylonians. And what that created, I have no problem with what it created, but what it created was the opposite of what people wanted the PACs, the super PACs, all that. Now people are even more enraged because, well, no, this is what you got. This is what you wanted. You wanted this. This was the plan. This is what I was supposed to do and make things transparent or whatever and do this thing. Guess what? Now you have this thing. Which people are even more angry about because well, and, and it, you see, it's it's that it's those unintended consequences. For example, yeah. um, it used to be that CEOs were often paid, you know, just marginally better than everyone else. But then it's like, hey, man, what's up with these CEOs not disclosing their salaries? We need to disclose it again. Very well intentioned, but then all of a sudden, uh, stockholders and board members were were to say, like, do you realize that Oracle's paying their CEO three billion dollars a minute? And they're like, how are we supposed to look like a competitor to them when we're paying our CEO only? Three hundred thousand dollars. It caused at the direct requirement that they that they needed to disclose CEO salaries is what caused the grossly, obscenely overinflated uh, CEO salary game that we've seen. Yeah, yeah. And you look at you know, and it's and you can see an example of that in public universities of what university presidents get paid too. And then what happens there? Weird things too about compensation packages and how uh, you know they can get compensated for weird, weird, all these sort of weird strategies and stuff. But anyhow, um, we all want the same thing. The fear is just that the, the people don't don't think that Time Warner and Verizon and Comcast are like, ah, we're foiled. We'll never <laughs> figure out what to do now. No, no. Uh, I guess that, yeah, no. Uh, uh, all right, well, look, I, I got to go do these stand-ups. I will catch you guys later. Good show, man. That was a lot of fun. Bye. Snip, snip, snip. Snip, snip. All right.